Welcome to the first video of Section 1 discussing what is Civil 3D. Upon completion of this video, you will have an understanding of what Civil 3D is and at its core, the power of a civil engineering dynamic model. Civil 3D is compelling civil engineering software that creates smart relationships between drawing objects so any changes to your design are updated automatically. With this dynamic technology, Everything from surfaces to alignments and corridors will update automatically based on the relationships with their objects. Let's look at an example of this. We'll begin by looking at the relationship between an alignment and an associated profile. We have two viewports in model space. Let's zoom to the bottom viewport to focus on the end of our alignment. And in the top viewport, we'll focus at the end of our profile. Notice that when we select the alignment and grip edit it, the profile, the red line as shown here, updates automatically to reflect how the existing ground looks with the updated alignment change. As you would expect, the data for this change can also be found in the labels and tables associated with both the alignment and the profile. Now, because we have an existing corridor object in this file, and it is linked to the alignment and the profile, Civil 3D is notifying us that this corridor needs to be rebuilt because the Rebuild Automatic option was toggled off. To update the corridor, simply right-click on it, and choose Rebuild. Notice how the corridor model updates to reflect the change in the alignment. Let's look at another example of this. Let's zoom into a sample cross-section in our drawing. And in the top viewport, let's make a change to the proposed profile. Again, Civil 3D will notify us that the corridor needs to be rebuilt. Right-click and Rebuild. And notice how the cross-section view updates automatically, including all the daylight subassemblies as well. These parametric changes can be made to occur automatically by choosing the Rebuild Automatic option in the same menu. In summary, this is what Civil 3D is. Civil 3D is a powerful and dynamic engineering tool that can be used on transportation, land development, and utility projects. In the next video, we will be discussing what you should expect from this course. This concludes this video discussing what is Civil 3D. Welcome to the second video of Section 1, What You Should Expect from This Course. Upon completion of this video, you will have an understanding of what you should expect from this course and the object types that we will examine in this course. So what should you expect from this course? Well, in this course, we will discuss the major design aspects of using Civil 3D and go over the following topics. We will discuss the Civil 3D interface, surfaces, alignments, profiles, assemblies and subassemblies, Core modeling and pipe network. There is also an accompanying data set that is included with this course, and I will mention what file to use prior to discussing the video topic that will be discussed. In summary, we discussed the expectations of this course. After you complete this course, you should have a good grasp of the basics of using Civil 3D and be able to start your first real world civil engineering project. In the next video, we will discuss working with the data set for this course. This concludes this video discussing what you should expect from this course. Welcome to the third video of Section 1, Working with the Dataset for this course. Upon completion of this video, you will have an understanding of starting Civil 3D and working with the dataset for this course. As many companies have different practices and different locations for their data, we need to discuss how you, the viewer, can get the dataset to work properly. The most important aspect for the dataset to work is for the working folder that is defined by Civil 3D to be set to the correct location. By default, this is C colon Civil 3D projects. However, if this file location is not defined properly, the dataset may not work correctly. First, what you need to do is place the dataset folder under the C drive Civil 3D projects folder. Next, let's examine how to start Civil 3D for the dataset to work properly. We will work with the default Civil 3D profile. To do so, navigate to the Windows button, All Programs, Autodesk, AutoCAD Civil 3D, and then we're going to use the AutoCAD Civil 3D English icon. I have copied it to my desktop for easier access. Now, let's discuss how to set the working folder in Civil 3D. While in Civil 3D, navigate to the Tool Space Prospector tab. If this is not open, you can navigate to the Home tab, Palettes Panel, and toggle it on here. Next, collapse any drawing you have open, and then in the category called Data Shortcut, simply right click and choose Set working folder. Then, in the Browse for Folder dialog box, navigate to C colon Civil 3D Projects and select it and then click OK. 
This defines the working folder to now be under Civil 3D projects. In summary, we examined how to start Civil 3D and set the Civil 3D working folder to point to locations where your projects exist. In the next video, we will examine the Civil 3D interface. Welcome to the fourth video of Section 1, the Civil 3D workspace. Upon completion of this video, you will have an understanding of what a workspace is and how to work with the Civil 3D workspace. If you'd like to follow along with this video, please open the file 0104, the Civil 3D workspace.dwg, located in the training folder as discussed in the Working with the Dataset for this course video. Civil 3D ships with predefined workspaces that help you use Civil 3D more effectively. To switch between workspaces, navigate to the lower right part of the application window and click on the workspace switching icon down below here. There are four workspaces that ship with Civil 3D. The one that we'll be working with is the one called Civil 3D. So make that your active workspace. For those of you not familiar with what a workspace is, simply put, a workspace is a stored configuration of all the available interface components in AutoCAD. This includes the ribbon tabs, the palettes, and the command line location. It is recommended to save your own Civil 3D workspace so you can always revert back to the original one should something go wrong with your workspace. To create your own workspace, simply select the Save Current As and then give it a name. As an example here, I've used my initials underscore C3D. Another recommended setting is the Workspace Switching setting. Navigate to the Workspace Switching icon, Workspace Settings, and by default, when switching workspaces is toggled on to Do Not Save Changes to Workspace. What this will do if this setting is set is any changes you make to your workspace, like moving a toolbar, turning a ribbon tab off, etc., will not be saved the next time you come in. So toggle on Automatically Save Workspace Changes. That way, any changes you make will be saved the next time you come into Civil 3D. Civil 3D leverages the ribbon interface, just like standard AutoCAD does. As you will notice, the Home tab contains the most commonly used commands to create Civil 3 objects, such as alignments, profiles, corridors, etc. We will be leveraging the ribbon interface throughout the course. One of the things that Civil 3 leverages with the ribbon is a contextual ribbon. What this means is that if you select an object that is a Civil 3 object in AutoCAD, Civil 3D becomes a contextual ribbon. As you can see, when I select this surface, it contains common surface tools. Another example, if we press Escape here, let's go ahead and zoom in and select this alignment here. Notice, because we only have an alignment selected, it contains alignment-specific tools. In summary, we examined the available workspaces in Civil 3D and how to work with the Civil 3D workspace and leverage the Civil 3D ribbon. In the next video, we will discuss Civil 3D settings and styles. Welcome to the fifth video of Section 1, Civil 3D settings and styles. Upon completion of this video, you will have an understanding of how Civil 3D object is controlled, an understanding of the settings hierarchy, and how to create and edit Civil 3D styles. If you'd like to follow along with this video, please open the file 0105 Civil 3D Settings and Styles.dwg, located in the training folder as discussed in the Working with the Dataset for this course video. The Tool Space window is where the Prospector, Settings, Survey, and Toolbox tab reside. Civil 3D uses styles and settings to automate CAD standards and design settings within the Civil 3D environment. Civil 3D styles and settings are probably the most important aspect of Civil 3D and having a good set of styles and settings defined before using Civil 3D in production will make it a lot easier for you to use it within your organization. Also, Civil 3D settings and styles are stored in a drawing template, making it very easy for you to maintain CAD standards or use Civil 3D with another client's standard. Let's navigate to the Settings tab of the tool space and examine Settings. The settings for Civil 3D have a top-down hierarchy. What this means is that settings are defined in the Drawing Settings category initially and then trickle down into the sub-categories. Now the settings above will try to override the ones below, but the ones below always win. There are three types of settings in Civil 3D. You have Drawing Settings, which I've shown here by right-clicking on the actual file name in the Settings tab. These are global settings that affect the entire drawing. You then have Feature Settings, which are specific to the feature, such as a surface, alignment, etc but we'll initially grab the settings defined here in the drawing settings. Then you have command settings. So each command has its own settings that allow you to override any of the settings defined above. To access any of the other settings, such as feature settings, simply right-click on the category and choose Edit Feature Settings. If you expand a feature and then expand commands, you have all the commands and you can right-click on those and choose Edit Command Settings.
Let's talk about styles. Civil 3D uses two types of styles, object styles and label styles. Object styles are associated to every Civil 3D object such as surfaces, alignments, profiles, and so on. And label styles are associated to the annotation of those objects. Let's look at a Civil 3D object style and see how it controls a Civil 3D object. Before navigating to the style that we want to examine, let's go ahead and select the surface, navigate to the properties palette, and notice how this surface is using a style called contours, one foot and five foot background. Press escape and let's navigate to this style in the settings tab. The settings tab is organized neatly into the different design object categories. Let's navigate to the surface category, surface styles, and here is the style that's being used. To edit this, you can either right click and choose edit or you can double click the style. Notice that next to some of the styles, there's a little orange icon. This icon is a linking icon that's telling you that somewhere either in the drawing or through the settings or styles, it's being linked to. Let's go ahead and choose edit. The object surface style dialog box contains the different tabs available for surface specific data. Depending on the object style that you are editing, you'll have different tabs. The one tab that is common throughout is the display tab. The display tab controls what layer and properties each of the subcomponents of the Civil 3D object will go on. So let's say for instance, we wanted to turn on the border subcomponent. We'll go ahead and toggle on the light bulb and simply click apply and notice how the border subcomponent is now turned on and will go on this layer here. We'll go ahead and click OK to dismiss the dialog box. To create a Civil 3D style, there are two ways to do so. Right click on the collection of styles that you want to create one from and choose new. Or you can start out with one by right clicking on it and choosing copy. In summary, we discussed how Civil 3D uses settings and styles to control Civil 3D settings as well as the display of the Civil 3D objects. In the next section, we will discuss an overview of surfaces. Welcome to the first video of Section 2, an overview of surfaces. Upon completion of this video, you will have an understanding of what a Civil 3D surface is and how to create a Civil 3D surface. If you'd like to follow along with this video, please open the file 0201 surfacesoverview.dwg located in the training folder as discussed in the Working with the Dataset for this course video. Surfaces are used to represent an area of land on the Earth. They contain three-dimensional geometric data such as points, contours, break lines, and boundaries. Once surface data is added to the surface, the surface will be made up of triangles or grids which are generated when Civil 3D connects the points that make up the surface data. The Prospector tab is where you manage surfaces that are in your drawing. If you look at the Prospector tab, there is a Surfaces category. If we expand this, you'll notice we have two surfaces here, one called Arial and one called EG. To create a surface, simply right-click on the Surfaces collection and choose Create Surface. Notice that there are some other options in there as well. If we click on Create Surface, you'll notice that in the Type drop-down, there are four types. You can create a tin surface, a grid surface, a grid volume, or a tin volume surface. The one you'll use the most is definitely the tin surface one. Now the data inside the surface is dynamically linked to whatever data was used to create the surface. If we expand EG and expand definition, notice the different types of data that you can add into the surface. To add any of these specific categories, you simply right click on it and choose add from the shortcut menu. You'll notice that in this surface, we have break lines in this surface, as well as a point file well that came from the survey data. As mentioned before, What's great about surfaces in Civil 3D is they are dynamically linked to the data that was used to bring them in. For instance, if we go ahead and zoom into this break line here, and I'll go ahead and select it, and this is a 3D polyline, and if I make any kind of changes to this 3D polyline, you'll notice that the triangles and contours update the surface automatically. Now, the reason the surface is updating automatically is that there is an option to rebuild the surface automatically. This setting is located on the surface name, and if you right click, here is the rebuild automatic option. If you do not want this option, you would set it to off, and then when you change an object that is linked to the Civil 3D surface, you'll notice you get an out of date icon that appears next to the surface. Simply right click on it and choose rebuild, and now the triangles and contours will update automatically. In summary, we examined what Civil 3D surfaces are how objects dynamically interact with the surface, and how to create a surface. In the next section, we will discuss adding data to a surface.
Welcome to the second video of Section 2, Adding Data to a Surface. Upon completion of this video, you will have an understanding of how to add data to a surface and what types of data you can add to a surface. If you'd like to follow along with this video, please open the file 0202 adding data to a surface.dwg located in the training folder as discussed in the Working with the Dataset for this course video. So, how do you add data to a surface? First, let's make sure that the Toolspace Prospector tab is open. And let's go ahead and navigate in the Prospector tab and create a surface. To do so, simply right click on Surfaces and choose Create Surface. Verify that Tin Surface Type is set, and we'll go ahead and give this surface a name of EG. We'll go ahead and give it a style of exclamation point Tin Editing. This style has the triangles, points, and borders displayed so we can see the updates to the surface automatically. Click OK and click OK. First, let's go ahead and add some break line data. The break lines in our drawing are 3D polylines that came from survey data. When adding surface data, sometimes it's easier to actually make a selection set first. So let's go ahead and do so. I'll simply do a crossing window starting over here, like so. Even though we have blocks in our selection set, it does not matter. Civil 3D will filter them when you add the break lines in. Let's go ahead and expand surfaces, expand EG, and expand the definition category. To add break lines, simply right click on the break lines category and choose add. For a description, you don't need to enter anything, but sometimes it makes sense to, to help you later on when you're investigating how you added data. We'll go ahead and just say from survey. And notice the different types of break lines that you can bring into Civil 3D. We're going to use the standard option as these are true 3D break lines. Notice the option to weed out additional vertices that may be contained in the 3D polylines, as well as adding vertices based upon possibly short distances within your break lines. We'll go ahead and simply click OK. And as you can see, our surface is created. Now, let's look at adding some point data to the surface. There are many ways to add point data to your surface. You can use existing Civil 3D points that may have come from survey, or you can import a point file. Importing a point file is a more efficient way, as the points will not actually live in the drawing. Civil 3D will simply reference this point file and any changes made to the point file will notify you that the surface is out of date. That said, be sure to check the point file for any bogus points that may be at elevation 0 or the infamous 999 or negative 999 elevations. Let's go ahead and right click on point files and choose add. Click the plus sign to add a file. Note that in here you can actually add multiple files. Let's go ahead and navigate to our dataset location and change our files of type to CSV. Select the random points from survey and click open. Now what you need to do is you need to match the point file format. In this case, it's PNEZD, point number, northing, easting, elevation, raw description. Let's go ahead and click OK. And as you can see, the point file is now being referenced into this surface. And of course, we can zoom in to verify that with all the triangles. Now, let's look at an area of our project that was flown and we are provided contour data. A named view has been provided for you to easily restore the layer snapshot and the location. Click on the View tab, Views panel, and click on Contours only. And here are the contours we're going to add to the surface. We're going to do so in a different way. Let's go ahead and first create a brand new surface. And in a future video, we will discuss editing surfaces by pasting them together. Let's go ahead and create a brand new surface. Right click on surfaces and choose create surface. We'll go ahead and give this a name of Arial and change your style to 2 and 10 background and go ahead and click OK. Now let's expand Arial and expand definition and right click on the contours category and choose add. If you'd like to give it a description for a future interrogation of the surface, you could say from Arial survey. Notice the options for weeding and supplementing the contours. There are also some toggles to help minimize flat areas. We'll leave the default toggles on and the default settings for the weeding and supplementing and go ahead and click OK. Civil 3D prompts you to select contours. We'll do a crossing window like so. And if we zoom in, notice how the text objects are not getting selected as Civil 3D knows to only select certain objects with this prompt. Press Enter. And now our surface is created. Now, Let's go ahead and zoom in here and notice how the contours match exactly as the contours that we have for the 2D polylines. This is pretty cool. In the next step, let's take a look at adding boundaries to the surfaces. First, let's go ahead and thaw. 
the building underscore plan underscore x layer, and we'll also thaw the surface existing perimeter layer. A little trick here in the layer dropdown, just type in SU, and that will get you right down to that layer. We'll go ahead and thaw that layer, and notice how we have a boundary object already created to use to trim out the surface. So while we're in the aerial surface, let's right click on the boundaries category and choose add. We'll call this exterior. Make sure mid ordinate distance is set to point one and non-destructive break line is toggled on. Verify that the type is set to outer boundary and go ahead and click OK. At the prompt, go ahead and select the object here and notice how the triangles are trimmed out automatically. Let's do the same thing with our EG surface. Let's go ahead and thaw the C-topo-EG layer. Again, just type in C-T, that will get you down to the C-topo layers. Now what we're going to do is we're going to first add in a hide boundary. So we have this building area where we don't want the triangles to appear. So we'll go ahead and collapse Arial and expand EG, and we'll expand the definition category. Right click on boundaries and choose add. This will be a BLDG pad for a description, and this will be a hide boundary. Again, toggle on non-destructive, 0 0.10, click OK, and go ahead and select the building pad polyline and press Enter. Notice how the triangles disappear, as this is a hide boundary. In other words, any triangles that are within this area should not display. Finally, let's go ahead and add an exterior boundary for the EG surface. We'll go ahead and right click on boundaries and choose Add. We'll call this one exterior as well. This should be an outer, non-destructive, 0.1, and click OK. Go ahead and select the polyline, which is the exterior boundary, and notice how the triangles get trimmed all on the outside of the actual surface. This is great. However, if we look in here, you will notice that the hide boundary that we just added looks like it was deleted. This is not the case. We will look at how to fix this when we talk about editing surface properties. In summary, we examined some of the different object types that you can add to a surface and how the object data is automatically linked to the surface. In the next section, we will examine surface properties. Welcome to the third video of Section 2 discussing surface properties. Upon completion of this video, you will have an understanding of what surface properties are and how they can affect how the surface gets built. If you'd like to follow along with this video, please open the file 0203-servicepropertiesdwg located in the training folder as discussed in the Working with the Dataset for this course video. Surface properties allow you to change many of the settings in the order of operations within a surface. There are a few ways to access the surface properties. One way is to select the surface and in the contextual ribbon, navigate to the surface properties dropdown. Notice the option to edit the surface style in here as well. Let's click surface properties and here we have the surface properties dialog box. The surface properties dialog box contains four tabs. The Information tab allows you to change the name, description, surface style, and render material. Notice the option to lock the surface. This is a very convenient method to locking a surface so that no one can make edits to it such as moving, rotating, etc. The Definition tab is where you define the build, data, and edits operations. The Definition tab also contains all of the history of your surface. This is one of the great things about creating surfaces in Civil 3D. It records every surface definition that you've done for this surface. What's also nice about surface operations is that you can change the order of how they rebuild the surface. For instance, the building pad that is a hide boundary is not being considered in the rebuild operation. Let's go ahead and select it and move it below the exterior boundary. Notice how the surface is out of date. Go ahead and click apply and we'll go ahead and click on rebuild the surface and notice that the hide boundary is now being honored. Really cool. Now, let's go ahead and toggle off the exterior boundary because let's look at another way to actually get rid of the large triangles that sometimes occur when you create surface data. Let's expand the build operation and notice some of the really great options available. The one that we're interested in is the use maximum triangle length. Let's go ahead and set this to yes and set the maximum triangle length to 50 units. We'll go ahead and click apply, rebuild the surface, and notice how this is way too low of a value for maximum triangle length, as it is removing some of the triangles within the surface as well. Let's go ahead and change this to 300, then click Apply and Rebuild the Surface, and now we are getting a much more accurate representation of the surface. Notice how the majority of the triangles outside the surface, where erroneous data exists, have been removed. There are many other operations that you can change and control in the Definitions tab. 
The Analysis tab is used for doing surface analysis like elevations, contours, directions, and slope arrows. Lastly, the Statistics tab gives you very relevant information about your surface, for instance, the 2D and 3D surface area, as well as elevation information that can help you understand if you have erroneous data in your surface. If you would like to copy this data into a text file or an email or even inside AutoCAD, simply right-click and choose Copy to Clipboard, and then you can press Control-V or Paste into any application. In summary, we examined what surface properties are and how you can control the display of the surface with surface properties as well as how the surface properties can control how the surface is built. In the next section, we will examine editing surfaces. Welcome to the fourth video of Section 2 discussing surface properties. Upon completion of this video, you will have an understanding of what surface edits are available. If you'd like to follow along with this video, please open the file 0204 editingsurfaces.dwg located in the training folder as discussed in the Working with the Dataset for this course video. Most surface edits are done by selecting the surface and choosing the appropriate surface edit from the contextual ribbon. However, before performing some surface edits, you must use a style that displays the triangles and points of the surface. In this drawing, we already have a surface style that displays the triangles and points. Let's go ahead and change the surface to that style. We'll select the EG surface, navigate to the Properties palette, and change the style to exclamation point, tin editing. And the surface now shows the triangles as well as the surface points. Now let's examine how to delete triangle legs. While we still have the surface selected, navigate to the Edit Surface dropdown, and to delete triangle edges, select the Delete Line tool. We'll go ahead and zoom into this part of our drawing, and we'll just simply do a crossing window. Note that you can also use the standard AutoCAD fence operation by typing F and then Enter. I'll click, and then right click, and now those triangle edges have been removed. If you'd like to on your own, you can continue to delete the additional erroneous triangles around the edges of the surface. For now, let's press Escape to end the deleting lines command. And with the surface still selected, let's go ahead and look at the surface properties. Again, as mentioned before, in the Definitions tab, one of the great things about surfaces in Civil 3D is it records everything that you do. So if you make a mistake, you can simply toggle it off or if you need to remove it completely, you can simply right-click that surface definition and choose Remove from Definition, and it will be removed permanently. Civil 3D also provides methods to edit, remove, or create surface points. This is not to be confused with actual Civil 3D points that the points may be referencing. Any edits you make to surface points will not change the actual data that they come from. Let's add some additional points that Survey forgot to locate. Let's zoom into our building area right here, and notice how we have these bollards and they forgot to actually locate this in the point file. However, we have these blocks, and they are actually at the true elevation that we would like to triangulate to the surface. So while the surface is still selected, navigate to the Edit Surface dropdown, and notice all the point modification tools that we can do. We want to add some points. We'll toggle on O-Snap, and make sure that Center Snap is turned on, and we'll just click. Notice how Civil 3D grabs the elevation that you actually snap to, in this case the true elevation, and we can simply press Enter, and of course the triangles update automatically because we have Rebuild Automatic turned on. We'll simply snap to the rest of these locations, making sure to press Enter afterwards, and there we have our points added to the surface. Press Escape to end the Create Point command, and press Escape again to clear our selection set. Now, let's look at the Paste Surface Edit command. In this drawing, we have two surfaces. We have the aerial surface as well as our EG surface. Since they are both existing ground surfaces, we would like to create a combined surface for the existing ground. The Paste Surface Edit command is a fantastic way to combine surfaces, and of course, any edits made to either surface will update the combined surface automatically. First, let's go ahead and select both of these surfaces and set them to No Display real quickly through the Properties palette. We'll choose a Style dropdown and click No Display and they're turned off very quickly. Press Escape to clear your selection set. Now, let's go ahead and create a combined EG by right-clicking on the surface, Create Surface, and we'll call this one Combined EG. We'll leave the default style of 2 foot 10 foot and click OK. Another way to access the surface edits is to expand the surface, expand definition, and right-click on here. Before doing so, let's go ahead and right-click on Combine EG and set this surface to Rebuild Automatic. That way, any changes made to the other surfaces will update this one automatically. We'll right-click on Edits and choose Paste Surface. 
When you paste surfaces, you always want to start with the outer surface and then paste the interior surfaces. This way, Civil 3D triangulates the surfaces properly. We'll go ahead and select EG and click OK. And quickly, our surface pastes in the EG surface. Now, we'll go ahead and right-click on Edits again and choose Paste Surface again. And now we'll add in the contours from Aerial Surface. Click OK. And as you can see, we now have one surface that combines the other two surfaces. Again, any changes made to the other surfaces will update this one automatically. In summary, we examined what surface edits are available and how you can easily make changes to your surface. In the next section, we'll discuss surface labels. Welcome to the fifth video of Section 2 discussing surface labels. Upon completion of this video, you will have an understanding of what surface labels are and the types of surface labels you can add to a surface. If you'd like to follow along with this video, please open the file 0205 surfacelabels.dwg located in the training folder as discussed in the Working with the Dataset for this course video. Civil 3D provides dynamic labeling functionality. What this means is that any labels you add to a Civil 3D object are associated with the Civil 3D object. Let's look at this labeling functionality as it relates to surfaces. The available labels that you can add to a surface are slope, elevation, and contour labels. To access your labels, let's go ahead and select the surface first, and you'll notice that in the Labels and Tables panel, there's an Add Labels drop down here. Now, we can select the default labels here, however, if you do so, you will not be able to choose which label style should be applied with this command. By default, what it does is it uses the label style defined in the command setting. To make it easier to control what labels will be used, let's click on Add Surface Labels instead. This will open up the Add Labels dialog box with the feature set to Surface. Now, as you can see, you can choose what label style you want to use. Let's first look at Slope Labels. If we click on the Slope Label Style drop-down, you'll notice these are the label styles available in this drawing. We'll leave it set to Percent and go ahead and click on Add. If you look in the command line window, there are two types of slope labels that you can add, one point or two point. One point will give you the exact slope as it falls on the triangle face. Two point will give you the slope between those two points and wherever those two points fall across the surface. We'll go ahead and zoom in here. Now let's go ahead and click on one point, and we'll go ahead and click in the drawing. As you can see, here is the label. If we press Escape and select the label, and move it around, you'll notice that it is dynamically showing you the actual slope as it falls across that surface. If you wanted to copy this label, that would be a fantastic thing too, as it also will show you the slope as it falls across that surface. Let's look at spot elevation labels. Notice with the spot elevation label, you can define the label style as well as the marker style. We'll go with elevation only, and for the marker style, we'll use a basic X. Go ahead and click Add. Notice how Civil 3D is asking us to select the surface. We'll go ahead and pick one of the contour edges. And now we'll just go ahead and click in the drawing. Again, if I keep clicking, you'll notice it updates automatically as it falls across that surface. And of course, if you move the label using the grips, it'll update the elevation as well. Really cool stuff. Lastly, you can, of course, add contour labels. Let's first look at a single contour label so we can explain what's going on with contour labels. We'll leave it set to the default label styles and go ahead and click Add. And what you're doing is first you select a surface and then you select over a contour line. You actually don't need to snap. You can simply just hover over that contour. Let's go ahead and press Escape and let's actually investigate to see what's happening. If you go ahead and select a contour label, you'll notice that there's actually a contour label line. This is a dynamic line that if you make an edit to, you will see it automatically shows you the elevation as that contour label line moves across the surface and finds a contour. Pretty cool stuff. Now, of course, you wouldn't do this manually, so there is a command to actually do this at multiple intervals. We'll go ahead and click on Contour, Multiple at Interval, and let's say we don't want minor contour labels, so we'll go ahead and set this to None, and we'll go with the default ones. Click Add. Look at the command line window. It's asking us to select a surface. It says, pick the first point. So you want to start somewhere at the beginning of your surface because you're going to define intervals to place small little contour label line. We'll just go ahead and click this way over here. And it says, enter the interval along the contour. Let's go ahead and type in 200 and press Enter. And you will see it will create contour label lines at every 200 foot location. You'll even notice that it does it across the minor contours as well, and so on. To make any kind of edits to these contour label lines, or to change which contours they display on, select one, 
right click and choose Select Similar. Notice how every contour label line gets selected in the file and you can navigate to the properties palette and change any of the properties for those specific contour label lines. In summary, we examined what surface labels are and the types of surface labels available. In the next section, we will discuss an overview of alignments. Welcome to the first video of Section 3, discussing an overview of alignments. Upon completion of this video, you will have an understanding of what Civil 3D alignments are, how to create alignments, and the settings and styles that control alignment creation. If you'd like to follow along with this video, please open the file 0301 alignmentoverview.dwg located in the training folder as discussed in the Working with the Dataset for this course video. Alignments are used in almost every civil engineering project. They help you lay out roads, bike trails, and even railways. Any design that will need to follow a linear type fashion will start out as a horizontal alignment. Civil 3D provides many ways to create horizontal alignments. You can create alignments from scratch using the layout tools or from standard AutoCAD objects like lines, arcs, and pylines. The alignment creation tools are located in the Home tab, Create Design Panel, Alignment dropdown. As you can see here, there are many methods to creating alignments. Alignments are stored in the Prospector tab in the Alignments category. If you notice here, there are different categories for the different types of alignments that you may need in a project. Alignments, as with everything in Civil 3D, have settings and styles that you need to be aware of before creating them. The settings and styles are located in the Settings tab under the Alignment category. As you can see, we have subcategories for the alignment styles, which control exactly how and where the subcomponents of an alignment will display. You also have design checks, which allow an alignment to follow the AASHTO standards, or design checks such as radial checks and tangent checks as well. And of course, we have the label styles category, which controls every aspect of labeling for alignments, including major and minor stationing, station offsets, line curve spiral, geometric points, and so on. And of course, we have table styles, if you have an alignment table for line, curve, or spiral, or segment tables, this is where you would define how those tables should get displayed. Lastly, if you want to control the actual command settings, such as toggles, default values, etc., expand the command as shown here, and you can change any of those different settings in here. Again, as with all the settings and styles in Civil 3D, to edit any of them, simply right-click and choose Edit, or if you need to create something new, you can right-click and choose New, or copy one from an existing one. In summary, we discuss an overview of Civil 3D alignments. In the next section, we'll discuss alignment element constraints. Welcome to the second video of Section 3, discussing alignment element constraints. Upon completion of this video, you will have an understanding of what Civil 3D alignment constraints are and how they affect how alignments can be edited. We will discuss fixed, floating, and free constraints. If you'd like to follow along with this video, Please open the file 0302 alignment element constraints.dwg located in the training folder as discussed in the working with the dataset for this course video. Certain constraints will be applied to horizontal elements automatically based upon the tools used to create them. Let's go over a description of each right now. The first one we'll talk about is fixed constraints. A fixed element has a fixed position at both ends. Fixed elements, though, are not necessarily tangent, and when you grip edit them, will lose tangency to adjacent alignment elements. Notice that when I select this alignment and move the grip, you'll notice that the tangency is not maintained between the arc and the tangent. Press Escape to clear your selection set. And let's go ahead and talk about floating elements. Floating elements are tangent to another horizontal element, either before it or after it. The following alignment has a floating curve attached to a floating tangent. When you grip edit these, you'll notice that tangency is completely maintained, as well as the fact that this arc here is completely floating off of the tangent that it's coming off of. Lastly, a free element is tangent to two other alignment entities. So an example, of course, would be a fillet between two tangents. As you can see when we grip pick this one, notice how it is free to move around because it's a free curve. In summary, we examine the different constraints used in alignments. In the next section, we'll discuss creating alignments using the PI method. Welcome to the third video of Section 3, discussing creating alignments using the PI method. Upon completion of this video, you will have an understanding of how to create an alignment using the PI method and edit them using various methods. If you'd like to follow along with this video, 
Please open the file 0303 creating alignments pi method.dwg located in the training folder as discussed in the Working with Dataset for this course video. One of the simplest methods to creating alignments is using PIs, points of intersection. To start the alignment creation tools, let's navigate to the Home tab, Create Design Panel, Alignment Dropdown, and then Alignment Creation Tools. Let's give this alignment a name of E US 90. The type of alignment is a centerline alignment. We'll leave the stationing at zero, set the alignment style to existing, and set our labels to major and minor only. Verify that design criteria is turned off as we do not need to have this turned on for this specific alignment. Go ahead and click OK, and the alignment layout tools appear. The alignment layout tools are categorized into the different methods. You'll notice the PI creation and edit tools here, and then we have the fixed floating and free constraint type tools throughout over here. What we first want to do is we want to define the default radius that should be set when we create our alignments using the PI method. Click the drop down and choose Curve and Spiral Settings. For this one here, we'll define it as 3280 and go ahead and click OK. Now we're going to use Northing and Eastings to define our PIs. So you want to have the Transparent Command Tools open, which I have right here. If you do not, navigate to the View tab, User Interface Panel, Toolbars, Civil, and then Transparent Commands. There's an existing multi-leader that you're going to use to snap to to begin the alignment. So let's go ahead and pick the PI dropdown and pick Tangent, Tangent with Curves. We'll go ahead and snap to the endpoint, and we are now beginning our alignment. I'm going to zoom out a little bit so we can see the PIs as they are created. Go ahead and click on the Northing and Easting Transparent command. Note that you can also type in apostrophe NE if you wanted to as well. We are prompted for the Northing, and for the Northing, you want to type in 57 969 0.1280 and press enter. Then for the easting, type in 68260.004 and press enter. Then notice how our first PI is placed. We can keep going here. We'll type in for the next northing 59487.4491, press enter, 66780.1303, press enter. And notice how we have our curve as well in there with the ending PI. Press escape once to end the transparent command and notice how the tool continues if you wanted to place additional PIs. We are done. Simply press escape once and now your alignment is created along with all the stationing. To make any edits to this alignment you can simply select it and notice the grips that appear. So based upon how we created this alignment we get a PI grip, we get radial grips that allow us to redefine the radius, and so on. With the alignment layout tool still selected there's also a method to actually edit your alignment using a grid view. In the Alignment Layout Tools, navigate to the Alignment Grid View tool, and in the Panorama window, you'll notice that you can edit any of the different settings that you use to create the alignment. If you want to change the radius, you can simply type in a value here, press Enter, and it'll automatically update the alignment. Don't forget, because you're in AutoCAD, you can always do an undo, and that actually undoes the operation, in fact, editing the actual alignment object. In summary, we examined how to create alignments using the PI method and how to edit alignments after they are created. In the next section, we will discuss creating alignments using fixed floating and free methods. Welcome to the fourth video of section three, discussing creating alignments using fixed floating and free methods. Upon completion of this video, you will have an understanding of how to create an alignment using the fixed floating and free methods and how to edit alignments using the various methods. If you'd like to follow along with this video, please open the file 0304 Create alignments dash fix floating and free methods dot dwg located in the training folder as discussed in the working with dataset for this course video. There are many ways to constrain an alignment, and Civil 3D provides tools to enable you to add horizontal elements to your alignment to aid in the creation process. Let's discuss how to do this. First, notice the circles in our drawing that will aid you in creating the alignment using the different methods. We'll create our proposed alignment by navigating to the Home tab, Create Design Panel, and then Alignments, Alignment Creation Tools. Change your name to P-US-90. Set your style to proposed. Make sure you have alignment label set to all labels. And again, we're not going to use design criteria, but if you wanted to, you could toggle this on and notice the different options available here using the Ashto methods or design check sets. We'll go ahead and toggle it off. For this alignment, we want it to start at 100 plus 00, and we'll go ahead and click OK. Let's first choose the fixed line method. Notice the line dropdown contains fixed floating and free tools. We'll pick fixed line, 
We'll go ahead and snap to the existing alignment, as that's where we want to start. And we'll go ahead and snap to the center of this circle. Press Enter, and there is our first tangent. Now what we want to do is we want to create a floating curve that comes off of this. We'll go ahead and go to the Curve dropdown, and notice how it's categorized into Fixed, Floating, and Free Curve Tools. The one that we want is Floating Curve from Entity End, Radius Length. So click on More Floating Curves, Entity End, Radius Length. Again, when you don't know what to do, look to the command line window. Select Entity to Attach to. We'll go ahead and pick the Horizontal Elements, and what we want to do is we want this one to be clockwise. As far as the radius goes, the radius for this curve should be 1500. Press Enter. Notice the options available to define the curve length. We'll go ahead and type it in, but you have these additional options. It's 1356.27, and press Enter. And now we have that floating curve. Press Enter again to end that command, and notice how the stationing continues on. Now what we want to do is we want to define a floating line from the end of this curve. So we'll go ahead and navigate to the Line dropdown, and we'll select Floating Line from Curve End Length. We'll go ahead and pick the curve, and to specify the length, we'll simply snap from here all the way to there. Notice how it automatically grabs that value. Press Enter, and again the stationing is continuing. Now let's go ahead and draw a line from the center of these two circles. We'll click the Line dropdown, Fixed Line, and make sure you go in this order. It does actually matter. If you went the other way, it would not station at all. Press Enter. Notice how the tangent does not contain any stationing because this is a non-connected alignment. Now, all we have to do is simply do a free curve fillet between two entities' radius. Again, look at the command line window. We'll pick the first entity, which is the alignment, and then the second entity, which is the other tangent here. In this case, it's less than 180. Just press Enter. And the radius that we want is 2300. Press Enter and then enter again, and now notice how the stationing has updated automatically, because it is a connected alignment. Now, let's go ahead and create a side road alignment that will connect to our main line alignment. For this one, we'll go ahead and choose the Alignment dropdown, Alignment Creation Tools, and we'll call this one P-SR-10. Keep the defaults, go ahead and click OK. And for this one, all we have to do is simply click on the Fixed Line tool, which is already there, snap to the center, and then we'll do a Shift right click to access the O snap overrides, and we'll choose perpendicular. And all we have to do is simply hover over the line, snap, and then press enter, and there is our second alignment. Again, to make any edits, if you go ahead and select your alignment, you'll notice you get specific grips here. Again, based upon the constraints used to create the alignments, you will have the different types of grips here. Notice how tangency is being maintained because this is a floating curve. Don't forget, if you wanted to actually make edits, you could simply select your alignment here and choose Geometry Editor. And then we would simply use the Grid View tool, and you can make any changes that you want to the values defined in the Grid View. In summary, we examined how to create alignments using the fixed, floating, and free methods, and how to edit an alignment after it is created. In the next section, we'll examine alignment properties. Welcome to the fifth video of Section 3, discussing alignment properties. Upon completion of this video, you will have an understanding of what alignment properties are available and how they can affect your alignments. If you'd like to follow along with this video, please open the file 0305 alignmentproperties.dwg located in the training folder as discussed in the Working with Dataset for this course video. To view the alignment properties, first you select your alignment and in the contextual ribbon, navigate to the Modify panel and then we have the alignment properties. The Information tab is where the style of the alignment is defined as well as the type of alignment that this alignment should be. The Station Control tab is where you can change the stationing that the alignment should start with, as well as the reference point. So if you actually want to define a different location than the actual beginning of the alignment for that beginning of station, you could do so there. You can also add station equations if it is necessary for your design. The Masking tab allows you to mask out any regions that you don't want to see the alignment and station labels. A good example of this, of course, would be a bridge area. It's very simple to add them. You click on the Add Masking Region, you can then simply click in the drawing to define the station to station limits of where your masking should begin. Click Apply, and you'll notice the stationing and the alignment completely disappear. We'll go ahead and remove it, as it is not necessary for us to have it in this alignment. The Point of Intersection tab is where you define how, when you select the alignment, you want the alignment to change the individual curves and curve groups. The Constraint Editing tab is where you define how, when you edit the alignment, the constraints will control how the alignment gets edited. The Design Criteria tab is where you would define any kind of design criteria should your project require any. 
let's toggle on use criteria based design and we'll go ahead and add design speeds in a minute. Note that you can define a design criteria file. By default it goes here. But if you click the browse button, you can navigate to any design criteria file that you may need. These design criteria files can come from agencies, municipalities, and you can even create your own. You also have the option to use design check sets, which exist in the drawing. To add design speeds, you simply click on the Add Design Speed tool. We'll go ahead and just add a few in here. And notice that we can simply click on each of the different fields here to add the different locations of where our alignment changes with different design speeds. Within this tab, you can also tell Civil 3D to check for tangency between elements. If any of the design criteria is not met or there is no tangency between elements, a triangle will appear notifying you that the criteria is not being met and you can then resolve it. In summary, we examine the available alignment properties and how they affect the alignment. In the next section, we will discuss alignment reporting. Welcome to the sixth video of Section 3 discussing alignment reporting. Upon completion of this video, you will have an understanding of the available reporting methods for alignments. If you'd like to follow along with this video, please open the file 0306 alignmentreporting.dwg. If you'd like to follow along with this video, please open the file 0306 alignmentreporting.dwg located in the training folder as discussed in the Working with the Dataset for this course video. There are many ways to report on alignments. First, let's go ahead and choose our mainline alignment, and in the Modify panel, we'll select Geometry Editor. Then we'll go ahead and pick the Alignment Grid View tool. And in the panorama window, notice how we have all the information about the alignment. If you'd like to have everything in this view here, what you can do is simply right click and choose Copy All. And then within Excel, it'll automatically delimit the columns. You can then, of course, remove and sort the columns as needed. That's pretty cool. As a tip, that works with any Vista within the panorama window. Let's now look at using the toolbox in the Civil 3D tool space. If you navigate to the Home tab, Palettes Panel, we have the Toolbox tool right here, and it appears in the Tool Space palette. If you expand Reports Manager, there is an alignment category. Let's look at some of the different reporting capabilities you have available. So if we go ahead and double click Alignment Curve, this will allow us to export to an XML file, and then Civil 3D will use something called a Style Sheet to report on the XML file. First, let's click on Clear All to make sure we only get the Civil 3D object we're interested in. We'll click on Pick from Drawing, and we'll zoom in and go ahead and select our alignment, and then right-click. Go ahead and click OK, and within the Dataset folder, let's call this Alignment Report P-US-90. We'll click Save, and within your default browser, the report will appear with all the important alignment information. Lastly, let's look at a report tool that doesn't use XML style sheets, but rather is a program. If we go ahead and double click on PI Station Report, this will open up a dialog box allowing us to toggle on and off the different alignments in this file. We'll leave all three on and go ahead and click on Create Report. Again, in your default browser, you'll get a report on, on the PI stationing, northing, easting, distance, and direction. If you right click, you can of course simply print this out or you could select everything and then copy and paste this into Excel, Word, or whatever application you need to. In summary, we examine the available alignment reporting capabilities. In the next section, we will examine alignment labeling. Welcome to the seventh video of Section 3 discussing alignment labels and tables. Upon completion of this video, you will have an understanding of the available methods for alignment labeling and creating alignment tables. If you'd like to follow along with this video, Please open the file 0307 alignment labels and tables.twg located in the training folder as discussed in the working with the dataset for this course video. Civil 3D provides many ways to create alignment labels and tables in your drawing. To begin the label process, you should first select your alignment. However, if you don't, all label and table functionality is available in the annotate tab labels and tables panel. However, we will go ahead and select our alignment and notice how we have the labels and tables panel. We'll go ahead and click the Add Labels drop-down. If you do choose the command right off the bat, what will happen is Civil 3D will not give you the opportunity to define what label style should be used. It'll simply use the default ones as defined in the command settings. So it's best to always choose the Add Alignment Labels, and then in the dialog box, you can always change what label style you want to use. There are two types of Station Offset Labels. You have Station Offset Fixed Point and Station Offset. We'll first start with the Station Offset Fixed Point, 
and we'll see what it does after we place the other station offset label. We'll choose station offset and coordinates. We'll go ahead and choose the basic X and click add. Select your alignment and then simply click and space somewhere to place your station offset label. We'll now go ahead and choose the station offset label and we'll go ahead and click add again using the default settings. Select your alignment and now we'll go ahead and place the station offset label. Again, notice how you can actually type these in if you need to. Press enter to end the command. The difference between the station offset fixed point label and the station offset label are the following. A fixed point label will stay where it is and when you edit your alignment, it'll actually update the label style with the new offsets based upon the alignment edits. The station offset label, however, will actually follow the alignment wherever the alignment goes. So you got the best of both worlds, which is pretty cool. Next, we have single or multiple segment labels as well as PI labels. We'll investigate the multiple segment label. Notice that you have the opportunity to change the label style for lines, the label style for curves, and if you have any spiral curves, you can change those as well. Notice the option to define the default tag numbering that you want to start with here. So I'll go ahead and change this to 1, that way it begins there. Note that you cannot have duplicate L1s, L2s, etc. within your drawing. Go ahead and click OK. And we'll go ahead and click Add, and then we'll simply select the alignment, and notice how it automatically adds the labels, and these labels, of course, are dynamically linked to the objects. Don't forget, you are not locked into what this label is displaying. You can always change these. Simply navigate to the label style being used, and you can simply right-click on it and choose Edit, and you can add or remove any of the different settings that are defined in this label style. If you ever need to move around a label because it's in a congested area, simply select the label and use the grips to move things around. If I wanted to move this station offset label using, let's say, a multi-leader, I could simply select it and then choose this here, and notice how it automatically will allow you to move the label out of the way. If you need to add additional vertices to, let's say, move around other objects, you can do so by simply clicking the plus sign. And if you need to remove them, simply click the minus sign, and that'll get you back to the default multi-leader. Lastly, let's talk about tables. So let's go ahead and select our alignment. And in the Add Tables dropdown, these are the different types of tables. So based upon your design requirements, you can add just line tables, curve tables, just spiral, or you could add a segment table, which combines them all. We'll go ahead and choose that one. As with everything in Civil 3D, styles are applied to every object. So we have a table style that we can choose from. Let's select our proposed alignment. Notice that you can split the table and of course it'll remain dynamically linked to itself. We'll go ahead and just simply toggle it off and click OK. We'll place it in the drawing and there is our line curve table. Notice that in the alignment, however, the lines and curves got tagged automatically. Civil 3D does this for you. If you ever need to renumber your tags, let's say they didn't get placed in the correct order, you could simply select your alignment label and choose the renumber tags tool. In summary, we examine how to create alignment labels and tables. In the next section, we will discuss an overview of profiles. Welcome to the first video of section four, discussing an overview of profiles. Upon completion of this video, you will have an understanding of what Civil 3D profile and profile views are, how to create profile and profile views, and the settings and styles that control profiles and profile views. If you'd like to follow along with this video, please open the file 0401 profileoverview.dwg located in the training folder as discussed in the Working with the Dataset for this course video. Civil 3D provides similar creation tools to create profiles as you have for alignments. The creation tools are located in the Home tab, Create Design panel, and then we have the Profile dropdown. There are tools to create service profiles as well as design profiles. Profiles are stored in the Prospector tab under the alignment that was used to create them. As we can see here, navigating the centerline alignments category, we can expand the PUS90 alignment. And as you can see, we have two profiles underneath it. You'll typically have at least two profiles when doing design. One is the proposed design profile, and the other is the surface profile. You can have as many profiles as is necessary for your design under your horizontal alignment. Let's have a discussion about the difference between profiles and profile view. A profile is the actual grade line used to represent either a surface, like existing ground, or a proposed design profile. The profile view is simply an object where the profiles themselves live, as well as any other labels relevant to profiles or profile views. Any changes made to a surface profile will update in the profile view automatically. Now let's talk about the settings and styles you need to be aware of when working with profiles and profile views. 
Again, in the Settings tab, we have a Profile and Profile View category. So the profile, if you expand it, will have profile styles, which again govern how the profile itself will look. And then of course you have design checks for proposed profiles, any of the labels necessary to create profile related labels. And then of course we have the profile view, which again is the grid. Let's go ahead and expand the profile view style and let's look at one of these styles. Go ahead and double click no grid. And this opens up the profile view style dialog box. As you can see, there are many settings available for the profile view that you will need to set based upon how a profile view should plot at your company. To quickly change a profile view to use a different style, simply select the profile view, navigate to the properties palette, and as you can see, you can very quickly and easily change the style to whatever you want your profile view to look like. In summary, we discuss an overview of profiles and profile views. In the next section, we will discuss creating surface profiles and profile views. Welcome to the second video of Section 4 discussing surface profiles and profile views. Upon completion of this video, you will have an understanding of what a surface profile is and how to display them in profile views. If you'd like to follow along with this video, please open the file 0402 Surface Profiles and Profile Views.twg located in the training folder as discussed in the Working with the Dataset for this course video. Creating a surface profile is fairly easy to do in Civil 3D. First, let's zoom in and go ahead and select our alignment. Next, in the Launchpad panel, we'll go ahead and click on Surface Profile. In the Create Profile from Surface dialog box, let's go ahead and select Combined EG and click Add. Let's also point out that you can actually create sample offsets as well, which are dynamically linked at the offset you define here. If you wanted to go left of the alignment, you would type a negative number. And of course, positive would give you a right side offset. In the profile list, if you scroll to the right, you can change the style that this profile is using. In this case, we're OK because it is an existing ground profile, as well as the layer. You can change these afterwards if you'd like to. Notice how the Draw and Profile View button appeared because probably what you want to do is draw this profile in a profile view. Go ahead and click on Draw and Profile View, and the Create Profile View dialog box is simply a wizard. Notice the different settings that you can change here. Let's verify that our Profile View style is set to No Grid. If you click Next, It'll take you through the different stages of creating a profile view, whether or not you want to define a specific station range, a specific elevation minimum and maximum. Here you can change the same thing we just did in the surface profile creation process. Any data bands for existing and proposed elevations, we'll talk about these later on. And if you had any hatching that you wanted to see between two different surfaces, you could do that as well. For now, let's click Create Profile View. And somewhere to the right, go ahead and just place your profile view. Let's select the profile and navigate to the Profile Properties tool in the Modify Profile panel. Note that you can change the style right here. You can view the data. And if this profile did need to use design criteria, you could toggle it on or off here. Let's go ahead and click Cancel and press Escape. Now again, because this is a profile that reads a surface, any changes that are made to the alignment or the surface will update the profile automatically. Let's go ahead and change our views to see two viewports in horizontal. We use the viewport control to do so, and let's go ahead and set our view to the beginning of the profile. We'll go ahead and zoom into the beginning of our alignment, and let's go ahead and change the alignment, and notice that the profile will automatically adjust as you move it along the surface. Control Z, and that will undo that and update the profile as well. Really cool. Let's maximize this viewport by double clicking this icon there. Let's talk about selecting and deleting the different objects. Remember, if you select the actual profile and delete it, it actually deletes the existing ground surface profile. If you delete the profile view, however, it doesn't delete the profile, just the profile view is deleted. So just be aware of that's how Civil 3D treats the objects. Lastly, if you do need to move your profile around for, let's say, plotting purposes or just in general, what you do is select the profile view and simply pick the blue grip that appears and then move it where you want to and notice how the profile itself comes along with it. In summary, we discussed surface profiles and profile views. In the next section, we will examine design profiles. Welcome to the third video of Section 4, Discussing Design Profiles. Upon completion of this video, you will have an understanding of how to create design profiles and examine and update the profile view. If you'd like to follow along with this video, please open the file 0403designprofiles.dwg located in the training folder as discussed in the Working with the Dataset for this course video.
Civil 3D provides profile creation tools very similar to the alignment layout tools. Let's go ahead and create a design profile for this alignment. We'll zoom into our profile view and select it. In the Launchpad panel, we'll click on Profile Creation Tools. For the name of the profile, we'll go ahead and give it an underscore P-US-90. The reason for the underscore is that when we go to create the corridor model, this profile will be at the top of the list. We'll set the style to Layout. We'll use the Complete Label Set. And if this profile did need to use criteria-based design, you would simply toggle this off and then define which K-table you need to use based on your design specifications. You can also use design check sets, which are stored in the drawing. We'll toggle off criteria-based design. Click OK, and notice how the profile layout tools are very similar to the alignment layout tools. You have PVI methods, you have fixed floating and free tangents, and you have fixed floating and free curves. Very similar to the alignment layout tools, if you needed to define a default curve, you could click on Curve Settings and then set it here. We'll define our curves afterwards. For this profile, we need to use the transparent commands. Verify that they are up. Don't forget to add them in. Simply navigate to the View tab, User Interface Panel, Toolbars, and then Civil and Transparent Commands. The first thing that we want to do is we want our design profile to start on the existing grade of the existing ground at a specific station value. We'll go ahead and define our PVIs and then add our curves in later. We'll click on Draw Tangents. At the Specify Start Point prompt, navigate to the Profile Station and Elevation from Plan Transparent Command. Again, as I always say, when you don't know what to do, look to the command line window. It says Select a Profile View. So we'll go ahead and click our Profile View. And now it says Select a Surface. So in the Plan View, we'll go ahead and select the border of the existing ground. Notice how the jig comes up asking us to define a station. Our station value needs to be set to 170. So 100 plus 70 and press Enter. Although you don't notice it, Civil 3D has placed a point at that elevation at that station in the profile view. If you needed to get some more elevations from this surface, you could simply keep clicking and it would automatically grab those elevations. Since we're done, press Escape once. That puts us back into the Place PVI command. Now what we want to do is we want to define our next PVI based upon a station and grade. If you look over here, you'll notice in the transparent commands, the transparent commands that we're interested in for this is Profile Grade Station. Go ahead and select it, and it says Specify Grade. Civil 3D already knows what point we're at. We now need to define a grade. For this grade, we want negative 1, and then press Enter. Notice how Civil 3D shows the grade line. For this PVI, we would like it to be at 110, 70. So 110, and then 70, and press Enter. Notice how you can keep going. So what we want to do is pan across a little bit here. We'll type in negative 0.25 for the grade. And for this PVI, it should be at 128 plus 00. Press Enter. As you can see, our profile is starting to take shape here. At the Specify Grade prompt, type in 0.65 for a positive grade value and press Enter. The station we want here is 14,550. And press Enter. Notice how it puts it right at the end of our project. Press Escape once to get out of the transparent command and then press escape again to get out of the command completely. And notice how we have our labels appearing automatically. Since we have no curves, all that we're gonna have here is grade break labels. Let's now add our vertical curve information. We'll navigate to the curve dropdown and choose free vertical curve parameter. At the select first entity prompt, click on the first tangent and then the next tangent. For this curve length, we want a value of 1000. Notice, however, that you can go in and actually use a radius or a K value. Press Enter, there's our first curve. And we can keep going with this one. We'll click on the first entity for this one, the next one here, and for this curve, we want a curve length of 1500. Press Enter, and then press Enter again to end the command, and notice how our curve information has automatically appeared in the profile. If you scroll down to the bottom of the profile, you'll notice that there's a band here. This band is here to show us the existing and finished grade elevations. Notice how it's showing you the same exact elevation. The reason for this is that when we first created the profile with this band, the only profile in here was the existing ground. Let's look at the profile view properties and see how we can change this. Select your profile view and navigate to the Modify View panel, Profile View Properties. Note that you can change the style. You can even change the station to station limits on the fly. This will not actually delete or remove any of the proposed profile that may 
exist beyond the extents that you define here. It simply is showing you a view of where you want to see. Same thing with the elevations. If you click on the profiles, this allows you to clip the grid with a specific profile as well as change the styles being used. The tab we're interested in is the Bands tab. If you scroll to the right, you'll notice a column for Profile 1 and Profile 2. We want to change Profile 2 to now look at the elevations for the proposed profile. Go ahead and click OK. As you can see, it now updates automatically and will of course dynamically update based upon changes that you make to either the existing or the proposed profile. Really cool stuff. In summary, we discussed creating design profiles and looking at profile view properties. In the next section, we'll discuss editing profiles. Welcome to the fourth video of Section 4, Discussing Editing Profiles. Upon completion of this video, you will have an understanding of what tools are available to edit your profiles. If you'd like to follow along with this video, please open the file 0404 editingprofiles.dwg located in the training folder as discussed in the Working with the Dataset for this course video. Civil 3D provides many tools to edit your profiles once you've created them. First, let's look at grip editing. We'll go ahead and zoom into our mainline profile and select the profile. Notice that Civil 3D provides grips for the grade in, the grade out, as well as a tool to modify the entire PVI. And if you want to grip edit the actual vertical curve length, you could do so as well. Press Escape once to stop any grip editing. With the profile still selected, navigate to the Geometry Editor tool and then go ahead and click on the Profile Grid View tool. Let's zoom out a bit. Notice that in the panorama window, if you select a PVI or curve, it'll highlight in the actual drawing as well, notifying you of which one you are actually editing. You can change the station or elevation here, the grade in, the grade out. You can even change your vertical curve length if you wanted to. Let's go ahead and change this one to 1200, press Enter, and notice how it updates in the profile view automatically, including all the labels. There are many additional tools for editing profiles as well. For instance, if you wanted to add a PVI, you would click on the Insert PVI tool right here. Just simply click on the drawing, press Enter, and then you could add your vertical curve length. There's also the Delete PVI tool as well, and you simply click near one PVI, press Enter, and it's now deleted. There's also some really cool tools to copy a profile, as well as a tool to raise or lower the entire profile itself. In summary, we discussed the available profile editing tools. In the next section, we will discuss profile and profile view labeling. Welcome to the fifth video of section four, discussing profile and profile view labeling. Upon completion of this video, you will have an understanding of what tools are available to edit and create profile and profile view labels. If you'd like to follow along with this video, please open the file 0405 Profile and Profile View Labeling.dwg located in the training folder as discussed in the Working with a Dataset for this course video. There are many profile and profile view labeling tools to better communicate your design. First, let's go ahead and select this grade break label and notice the grips that appear. We can grip pick it and notice how it pulls it out into a nice leader. Now, let's say, however, the text being displayed here, which is the default label that says Grade Break Station, let's say we actually wanted to say something like begin the name of the alignment and then add the station and elevation. You can override the default label text. Let's go ahead and click on Edit Label Text and we'll select the profile label. It's asking us to pick the component to edit. In this case, we want the PVI start. Click OK. Now let's go ahead and delete the text that says grade break. So this is the text component editor, and this is simply a text editor window. We'll go ahead and type in begin, space, and add in the actual alignment name, and don't forget to click the arrow. And let's say we want this on its align by itself, we'll press enter. Now let's go ahead and click OK, and as you can see, you can override that label. Just so you know, this is standard functionality of Civil 3D labels. All labels can be edited in this manner. Let's press escape. And let's go ahead and select our proposed profile. Let's say we wanted to actually add the horizontal alignment points onto this profile, like the PC or the PT. Let's go ahead and click on Edit Profile Labels. Let's click on the horizontal geometry points and let's add in this label style by clicking Add. It prompts you to define which points you want to add to the profile itself. Let's toggle off the alignment beginning and end as we don't need that because, of course, we have it in the profile but the rest will leave on. Click OK. 
Click OK again. And now, as you can see, what's really cool is you can actually see the PC, PT, and the midpoint of all the arcs in the horizontal alignment. Let's press Escape to clear our selection set. Now let's look at adding profile view labels. Those are profile labels. Go ahead and select the profile view. And in the add view labels, we'll pick on station elevation. Notice you're prompted to specify a station. So let's say for whatever reason, we wanted to see a specific station elevation. Let's go ahead and snap to our existing ground, and we'll go ahead and snap again to that same exact point. And there's our station elevation. If I press Escape, you can actually pull this out, just like any of the other labels. And if you actually copy it, you can snap to the end point there. Notice that as you move it along, it automatically will update the station elevation of that label. Pretty cool. Lastly, let's go ahead and select the profile view again. And let's click on Add View Labels, and let's look at the Depth Label. With the depth label, what you can do is it allows you to snap between two different points to actually define a depth between the two different points. Don't forget, you're not stuck with these specific components in these label styles. You can always go to the Settings tab, Profile or Profile View category, and navigate to the label style category that you want to edit this label style. In summary, we discussed the available profile and profile view labeling tools. In the next section, we will examine profile reporting. Welcome to the sixth video of Section 4, Discussing Profile Reporting. Upon completion of this video, you will have an understanding of what tools are available to report on profiles. If you'd like to follow along with this video, please open the file 0406, ProfileReporting.dwg, located in the training folder, as discussed in the Working with Dataset for this course video. There are many ways to report on your profiles. The first one we'll look at is actually using the panorama window. Let's zoom in and select our profile. Navigate to the Geometry Editor, and then click on the Profile Grid View tool. This will open up the panorama window, in which we can see all the different properties our profile is set to. If you'd like to copy this, you can right-click anywhere and choose Copy All. Then, in Excel, you simply do a Control-V or Paste. As you can see, it brings them in column separated. Very nice. You can then, of course, use Excel tools to delete columns, delete rows, etc. Let's now look at using the Toolbox in Civil 3D Toolspace. If you navigate to the Home tab, here is the Toolbox if it's not open in your tool space. The Toolbox tab contains all the reporting utilities. If you expand Profile, you'll see that there are two ways that you can report on profiles. You can report on profiles using Style Sheets, which is using LANXML data, or there are tools that actually are programs that will report on your profile. Let's go ahead and look at one of the Style Sheet reports by double-clicking the PVI Station report. What you want to do here is click on the Pick from Drawing and this way, you don't get everything that's in the list there. We'll click our design profile and then right click, and that's the only object that will get saved as an XML file. Click OK and navigate to your dataset folder and call this one p us 90 parentheses vert for vertical alignment. We'll go ahead and click save. This will save out that HTML file as a land XML file, and then a style sheet is used to report on it to give you the PVI station elevation and grade in and out, as well as the curve lengths. Lastly, let's look at a report that does not use XML. We'll go ahead and double-click on the Incremental Station Elevation Difference tool. What this tool does, and it's pretty cool, is it'll take a design profile and then an existing one and show you the existing slash finish grade elevations in a nice tabular type way. We'll go ahead and define our station interval to 20, and then click on Create Report. If you get this error, just simply click Yes to continue and you automatically get a nice report that shows you the station easting and northing of the elevational difference between the two different profiles. You can then, of course, copy all this data into an Excel spreadsheet or simply print it out. In summary, we discuss the available profile reporting tools. In the next section, we will discuss assemblies and subassemblies. Welcome to the first video of Section 5, discussing an overview of assemblies and subassemblies. Upon completion of this video, you will have an understanding of what assembly and subassemblies are and the settings and properties behind them. If you'd like to follow along with this video, please open the file 0501 assembly and subassembly overview.dwg located in the training folder as discussed in the working with the dataset for this course video. So what are our assemblies and subassemblies? An assembly is a placeholder for your subassemblies. Let's select the assembly and notice how if I move this along here, all the subassemblies move with it. So, what then are subassemblies? 
Think of subassemblies as building blocks of your corridor model. They are Lego pieces that, when put together, form your corridor model. To create assemblies, you simply navigate to the Create Design panel, the Home tab, and the Assembly dropdown. Subassemblies, however, you will use your tool palettes to add subassemblies to your assembly. Assemblies and subassemblies live in the Prospector tab in the Assemblies category, and then you navigate to the assembly, and you'll notice here you can even navigate right directly to the subassemblies. What's really cool is that if you right click on the assembly, you can actually remove it from model space if you don't want it to display. It'll still live in your drawing, it just won't display in model space. Regarding the settings and styles that control assembly and subassembly display, let's navigate to the settings tab. If you scroll down, you'll notice that there are some styles for assembly and subassembly components. However, the assembly style is pretty basic as far as how the marker and the line should get displayed. The subassembly, you'll notice, only has command settings. This is because there is a different style that controls how subassemblies will get displayed. The style that is used to control subassembly display is under the general category, multi-purpose styles, and then we have something called code set styles. Before we delve into this style, let's talk about subassemblies and the different components that make them up. There are three components to a subassembly: point codes, shape codes, and link codes. Knowing this will help you decipher the codes that are controlling the subassembly display. Let's go ahead and select this subassembly and let's talk about the codes involved. Firstly, the circular components you see here are the point codes. Those codes will be used to connect the dots in drawing your feature lines eventually that will be created from your corridor model. The link code is actually each link code along this subassembly. This would be the top of surface might be your asphalt bottom or subgrade, and so on. And lastly, the shape code is the actual shape, which would be the volume of the shape that is inside the subassembly. Let's go ahead and double click the all codes code set style. As you can see, the code set style is categorized into the three different types of codes, allowing you to control any of the different codes that may be inside your subassembly. If we expand these, each of the different columns will map to the code defined here. As far as getting the name of this code, in a future video, we'll examine where you can find out the names used in a specific assembly, whether it's with the point, link, or shape code. You'll notice these additional columns which tell it how to display as far as the style, and each code will have other columns for the labeling, any kind of render material for visualization, as well as for hatching in plan view. Now let's look at the different properties that you can change with regards to assemblies and subassemblies. If you select a subassembly, your first go-to interface to make changes to it will be the properties palette. As you can see down below here, you can change pretty much any of the parameters defined here. If you select the assembly and navigate to the assembly properties, this is a good spot to see what codes are being used within this assembly. However, there are some additional properties that can only be changed in the assembly properties dialog box. For instance, a very powerful parameter is if you select a subassembly, you'll notice that there's this parameter reference which allows you to call up the slope from another link within this subassembly. In summary, we discussed how to create assemblies and subassemblies and the settings and styles behind them. In the next section, we will discuss creating assemblies for your corridor model. Welcome to the second video of Section 5, Creating Assemblies for Corridor Modeling. Upon completion of this video, you will have an understanding of how to create assemblies and subassemblies. If you'd like to follow along with this video, please open the file 0502, Creating Assemblies for Corridor Modeling.dwg, located in the training folder as discussed in the Working with the Dataset for this course video. To create an assembly, navigate to the Create Design panel, Assembly dropdown, and choose the Create Assembly tool. In the Create Assembly dialog box, let's give this assembly a name of Two Lane with Curve. Leave the assembly type set to Other, but let's click on it and notice the options available. This drop down is used in conjunction when you define super elevation for your alignment and must match the setting in the super elevation wizard. We'll leave it set to Other for now. We'll leave the assembly style set to Basic, Code Set Style of All Codes, and go ahead and click OK. Notice how we have a separate area in our drawing for our assemblies making it easier to find them in the future. We'll click in space, and here is our assembly. 
Now let's look at how you add subassemblies. As mentioned before, you add subassemblies by accessing them from the tool palettes. Before we place any, let's look at how you can access the help should you have any questions on what a specific subassembly does. To access the help, simply right click on the subassembly and choose help. The Civil 3D help provides an extensive help file for each subassembly, letting you know everything about that subassembly, including, if you scroll down to the bottom, all the codes that will be used by this subassembly. Before placing the subassemblies, it's always a good idea to have your properties palette docked somewhere in the AutoCAD window. This will make it easier to change properties for your subassemblies as you are placing the subassemblies. Let's navigate to the tool palettes and find the Lanes tab, and let's click on Lane Super Elevation AOR, which stands for Axis of Rotation. As soon as you click the tool, navigate to the Properties palette and notice the properties and parameters that you can change for this subassembly. Notice that you can change the widths, you can change each of the different depths for the different materials, and so on. We'll go with the defaults on the right side and click on the actual assembly itself to place our first subassembly. You are now prompted to give the subassembly a name. By default, this setting is turned off. However, we have turned this setting on in the Settings tab, Subassembly category, and in the Create Subassembly command. One of the things that is very important to do when you create subassemblies is to name them properly. This will help you when you eventually define targeting when you do your quarter modeling. Let's go ahead and call this one RT underscore LANE for right lane and go ahead and click OK. Now let's navigate to the tool palettes and find the curbs tab and we'll click on urban curb gutter general. Again, notice the parameters that you can change for any of the different dimensions in this curb. Now for this one here, let's go ahead and change our sub base extension to 0.5 and press enter. Now we'll zoom in, making sure we get the right point code, click on it, and we'll give this one a name of RT underscore curb and go ahead and click OK. And notice how we have decreased the sub base extension. Lastly, we need to add a daylight sub assembly. Let's go ahead and navigate to the tool palettes, daylight category, and notice how we have all the different scenarios that you can select from in the daylight tab. However, we are interested in a basic daylight sub assembly. Let's go ahead and navigate to the basic tab and notice how there's also one here called basic side slope cut ditch. Go ahead and click on it and navigate to your properties palette and notice that you can change any of the different parameters for this daylight subassembly. We'll zoom in to the back of curb, select the points, and we'll call this one RT underscore daylight. Click OK, and there is our subassembly placed. Press Escape to end the command. Now that you have created one side of the assembly, Civil 3D provides tools that make it very easy to move, copy, and mirror subassemblies. Let's select all three subassemblies, and in the Modify Subassembly panel, let's find the Mirror tool. What you're doing is you're selecting a marker point within the assembly that you want to mirror this about. In this case, it's the center line. So simply click on the assembly itself, and notice how it's now prompting you for the name. So we'll just go ahead and call this one Left Lane. Click OK. Left Curb. Click OK. Left Daylight. Click OK. Press Escape to clear your selection set. And there is our completed assembly. In summary, we discussed how to add subassemblies to an assembly. In the next section, we'll discuss modifying assemblies and subassemblies. Welcome to the third video of Section 5 discussing modifying assemblies. Upon completion of this video, you will have an understanding of how to modify assemblies and subassemblies. If you'd like to follow along with this video, please open the file 0503 modifyingassemblies.dwg located in the training folder as discussed in the Working with Dataset for this course video. Let's take a look at modifying assembly properties. To modify an assembly's properties, simply select it, and in the contextual ribbon, navigate to the assembly properties tool. Note that you can change the style right here, as well as the name of the assembly if you wanted to. If you click the construction tab, you can change the baseline, as well as the subassemblies listed here. Don't forget you also have the opportunity to change the assembly type which is used when working with super elevation. Don't forget, this has to match the super elevation type that you define in the super elevation wizard. Let's change our baseline name to ML1. Click once there on the baseline and click once again and type ML1 for the baseline. Note that if you select any of the subassemblies, you can change those settings here as well as those additional settings we, we talked about previously. 
Let's say we want to change the width here to 15 feet. We'll go ahead and select our width property, type 15, and click apply, and you'll notice it automatically moves the other subassemblies to adjust for the width. Don't forget you have the codes tab that also allows you to see what codes are being used in each of the subassemblies. Let's take a look at the command settings that control the name prompting for placing subassemblies in your drawing. Navigate to the Settings tab, Subassembly Category, and Expand Commands. Let's go ahead and double click Create Subassembly Tool. In the Command Settings, look for the Subassembly Options, and here's where you tell Civil 3D to prompt you every time you place a subassembly in the drawing. One of the simplest ways to change your subassemblies is to simply select them and navigate to the Properties palette and change things here. Let's go ahead and change the width back to 12 feet and press Enter and it'll adjust the subassembly for you automatically. Note that you also will change parameters such as how you want the outside point code to act with regard to super elevation and so on. You can also navigate to the subassembly properties and this will tell you specifically which codes this specific subassembly is using. In summary, we examined how to modify assembly and subassembly properties. In the next section, we'll discuss how to copy an assembly to a tool palette. Welcome to the fourth video of Section 5 discussing copying assemblies to a tool palette. Upon completion of this video, you will have an understanding of how to copy an assembly to a tool palette. If you'd like to follow along with this video, please open the file 0504 copying assemblies to a tool palette.dwg located in the training folder as discussed in the working with the dataset for this course video. First, let's discuss what tool palettes are. Think of tool palettes as your one stop shop for all the commands and standards that you may use. By default, the tool palettes is docked to the right side of your application window and auto hide is turned on. With Civil 3D loaded, the tool palettes will contain only the subassemblies. However, you can customize these to your heart's content to contain tools that you use on a daily basis. If you do not have the tool palettes open, navigate to the View tab, Palettes panel, and then we have the tool palettes right there. You can also press Control 3 as a shortcut. Let's turn Auto Hide on to keep the tool palettes available for us to see. The way you interact with anything in the tool palettes is to simply right click. And depending on where you are within the tool palette interface, you'll get a different shortcut menu. For instance, if you right click up here, you'll get the menu to customize palettes and toggle on to a specific group. You can also create new palettes here as well. If you right click inside a tool or on a tool, you will get a different menu to either copy a tool, rename it, or specify an image. Let's navigate to the assemblies tab so we can copy our assembly from this drawing into the tool palette for future use in, let's say, another project. To copy an assembly, simply select the assembly in the drawing. Then do not pick one of the grips, but pick one of the graphics to drag it onto the actual tool palette and let go. You'll notice that two lane with curb gets copied onto the assembly. So what is actually going on in the background? I would say there's no magic when it comes to things that happen in AutoCAD or Civil 3D. There's always some sort of setting or parameter that you just simply need to find out. So what happens in the background is Civil 3D is literally copying that assembly into a brand new DWG file with all the settings and styles necessary to reproduce that assembly into another file. As you can see here, here is a totally separate DWG file called Tulane with curb.dwg. It puts it into Program Data, Autodesk, the version of Civil 3D you're in, ENU, and then the Assemblies subfolder. In summary, we examined how to copy an assembly to a tool palette. In the next section, we'll discuss an overview of corridor modeling. Welcome to the first video of Section 6, discussing an overview of corridors. Upon completion of this video, you will have an understanding of corridor models and their dynamic nature. If you'd like to follow along with this video, please open the file 0601 corridoroverview.dwg located in the training folder as discussed in the Working with the Dataset for this course video. A corridor model is one of the most complex object types in Civil 3D. The corridor takes all the other Civil 3D objects that we just created, such as the alignment, profile, and assemblies, and creates a dynamic corridor model from them. When you create a corridor model, you define the frequency that it should model along with different targeting that may be necessary for your design. As with everything in Civil 3D, the corridor model is truly a dynamic model. Let's look at an example of this. Let's zoom in to this location of our corridor model and notice that we have an alignment here that is an offset alignment. If we zoom in and select it here, this alignment 
is a target for one of the subassemblies to stretch out a turning lane. If let's say I stretch this alignment to this new location over here, you'll notice that we get a notification that the corridor model needs to be rebuilt. There is an option if you right click to have this rebuild automatic. I don't recommend that you do this as any changes made to any of the previously defined objects that make up this corridor will immediately rebuild the corridor model, making your session in Civil 3D a little bit slower. We'll go ahead and click Rebuild, and you'll notice that the corridor model automatically targets the edit made to the alignment. Really cool stuff. Let's look at another example of this. Another really cool trick that you can do with targeting objects within regular AutoCAD is you can create actual constraint 2D geometrics. If I zoom in here, and I go ahead and select this polyline that is underneath the corridor model, you'll notice it's actually using 2D constraints. So I have made a regular 2D polyline that's at zero elevation, have geometric constraints such as tangents, coincidence, and so on. And this can also act as my, let's say, turning lane, or in this case, it's a grass panel. And of course, you can target these objects within your corridor model. And if you make any kind of changes whatsoever to this object, again, notice the out of date notification, right click, rebuild, and the assembly will automatically target the edit to that polyline. Just really unbelievably cool stuff. What's also cool about the corridor model itself is that the corridor model, just like with the subassemblies, has the ability to associate to a code set style. Remember, a code set style tells Civil 3D how to display the different components of a corridor model. Remember, those are point codes, shape codes, and link codes. So if I change my code set style to, let's say, one called visualization, You'll notice here immediately I am left with my line work, which again is really cool. That's saving me a little bit of time to have to even generate my 2D line work. But if I take this object into something called the object viewer, so let's navigate to the general tools panel, object viewer, and let's just kind of rotate our view around here to get kind of a 3D view of the road. And I'll go ahead and zoom in to this part where the grass panel that we just edited was. And if I change my visual style to realistic, you'll notice that automatically, because of the code set style, the corridor model comes in rendered with the correct materials. Just really, really amazing stuff. In summary, we examined an overview of corridors. In the next section, we'll discuss creating corridors. Welcome to the second video of Section 6, Creating a Corridor. Upon completion of this video, you will have an understanding of how to create a corridor model. If you'd like to follow along with this video, please open the file 0602 create a corridor .dwg, located in the training folder as discussed in the working with the data set for this course video. So let's take a look at how you create a corridor model. To create a corridor model, navigate to the Home tab, Create Design Panel, and click the Corridor tool. Let's call this corridor US-90 and SR-10. With a corridor style, we'll leave it set to basic, P-US-90, and notice how the proposed profile comes up automatically because of the underscore. Set your assembly to primary road full section and set your target surface to combine DG. Verify that set baseline and region parameters is toggled on so we can change these afterwards. If you want to quickly model your roadway, and let's say this is enough for one baseline and one region, you could just toggle this off and click OK. Click OK. This opens up the baseline and region parameters dialog box where we can modify these and change things. Let's scroll to the right and let's change our begin station to 102 plus a pair or 10200. And our ending station will be 138 plus a pair. We're going to create a corridor for the entire main line, and later on, we'll do the intersection. Notice the options in case you made a mistake to change the alignment, the profile, or even the assembly. Let's say for the main line, we have two regions where we have an assembly where we match the existing sidewalk, and then our proposed assembly. To split a region, simply right click on it and choose Split Region. At the jig, you could simply click here. But we have an exact station where we would like to have our region split. 106 plus 50, and then press Enter. What's cool about the Split Region tool is that you can keep splitting here if you wanted to, but when you're done, you can simply press Enter. That will then put you back in the data box. If you receive this error, that's fine. Just go ahead and click OK. If we scroll to the right, you'll see that this region has been split. And now, from 102 to 10650, it's going to use that assembly. And from 10650 to 138, it's going to use that assembly. Now, it turns out the beginning of the project has a sidewalk that we need to tie into. So let's click on the assembly drop down here and go ahead and choose primary road full section with sidewalk match existing. 
click OK. And the last thing we need to do is define the frequencies for this model. We'll go ahead and click on Set All Frequencies to do so. Just a note here about frequencies. The lower that you set your frequency to, in other words, how often it will model, the more accurate the model will be. However, the corridor object will also take longer to process and rebuild as there are more modeling frequencies. We'll go ahead and change our frequency here to 15 for tangents. Along curves, we want it to be a little more accurate, so we'll do 5. And we'll do the same thing for profile curves. Note the options for horizontal, horizontal geometry points, and so on. These are all the PCs, PTs, PVI, PVC, etc. You'd probably want to model at those stations. Click OK, and let's go ahead and click OK to model a corridor. At this prompt, just go ahead and click on Rebuild the Corridor. As you can see, our corridor model is complete with the beginning with that assembly, and notice how it ties right back into the other assembly. To view this in a 3D type way to see exactly what's going on, simply select your corridor model. In the General Tools panel, navigate to the Object Viewer tool. Set your visual style to wireframe, and the Object Viewer has many tools to zoom around, do a zoom extents, zoom in and out. You can also simply click and move your mouse to rotate the view automatically to see your corridor model in 3D. Panning is also the same as it is in AutoCAD, where you simply hold the middle mouse button down. If we zoom in, we can actually see our corridor model and how it generates the different components within the corridor model. So again, we have point codes, which are connecting the lines. We have link codes, which are coming across the roadway perpendicularly. And we have the shape codes, which will eventually get our volumes if we needed to do volume calculations afterwards. In summary, we examine how to create a corridor model. In the next section, we'll discuss target mapping. Welcome to the third video of Section 6, discussing target mapping. Upon completion of this video, you will have an understanding of what target mapping is and how you can use it in a corridor model. If you'd like to follow along with this video, please open the file 0603targetmapping.dwg located in the training folder as discussed in the Working with Dataset for this course video. So what is target mapping and how can it make it easier for you to model your design? Let's zoom into our corridor model where we would like to target an offset alignment. An offset alignment is an alignment that is dynamically linked to the horizontal alignment. If the horizontal alignment shifts, then the offset alignment will move along with it with whatever tapers and offsets you've defined for it. A good example of an offset alignment is, let's say we need to add a truck lane to our design. This is where you would use an offset alignment. Within a corridor model, you can target alignments, pie lines, feature lines, profiles, 3D pie lines, and so on. Basically, any graphic that you can create, your corridor model can target as long as the subassembly that you are using allows it to be targeted. In other words, the subassembly is programmed to allow for targeting. The way targeting works is to first select your corridor model, and in the Modify Region panel, you'll notice there's a whole bunch of really cool tools. The one we're interested in is the Edit Targets tool. Notice that as you hover over the regions in your corridor model, they highlight in the drawing, letting you know exactly which region you're about to modify. We'll go ahead and modify this region first, as this is the region that we're interested in. This is why you should name your subassemblies with a name that makes sense. This makes it very easy to choose which of these with or offset targets I want to select from. The one we're interested in is the one that says right lane. We'll click on the object name field, and in the set width or offset target, look at the drop downs we have available to us. We can select alignments, feature lines, survey figures, or pie lines. We want alignments. And if you don't know the actual name, you can click on the Pick and Drawing button here. And we'll go ahead and select our offset alignment and then right click. It highlights in the field for you. You simply click Add. This lane subassembly will simply target that alignment and it'll stretch the lane. And whatever slope that lane is set to, whether you have super elevation applied or not, it'll just simply use that slope definition. Click OK and click OK again. The corridor model will rebuild automatically because it now has a target it has to go to. And as you can see, it has automatically targeted that offset alignment. If anything changes with the offset alignment, of course, the corridor will update automatically. Now, let's zoom into the beginning part of our project as we want to target this 2D polyline. We're still in the Edit Target command. You can simply click on the region now. And again, you want to name your subassemblies properly so you know which one to pick from in here. In this case, we want to target the inside boulevard of the right side. 
So here's the inside boulevard width of the right sidewalk subassembly. We'll go ahead and click on here. In this case, it's a 2D polyline, so we'll change the category and we'll click on Select from Drawing. Now we'll pick our 2D polyline, right click, it'll automatically add that polyline as a target. What's great about this functionality is you can select a whole mess of polylines depending on what you may have for targeting. The corridor model will automatically pick up wherever those polylines begin and end and stretch the subassemblies to those polylines you choose there. That's really cool. We'll go ahead and click OK. Click OK again. The corridor model will rebuild. As you can see, we are done with our targeting. Press Escape, and there is your completed corridor model with the subassemblies targeting those objects. In summary, we examined how to use target mapping on a corridor model. In the next section, we'll discuss corridor properties. Welcome to the fourth video of Section 6 discussing corridor properties. Upon completion of this video, you will have an understanding of corridor properties and how they control the corridor model. If you'd like to follow along with this video, please open the file 0604 corridorproperties.dwg located in the training folder as discussed in the Working with Dataset for this course video. Let's take a look at corridor properties. The corridor properties dialog box allows you to control all aspects of the corridor model. To access the corridor properties, simply select the corridor model in the Modify Corridor panel. Click on Corridor Properties. The Corridor Properties dialog box contains seven tabs. The Information tab is pretty simple. You can just change the name as well as the style, which simply controls how regions will appear in your plan and model view. The Parameters tab is where you can change the frequency of modeling, targeting, regions, alignments, or assemblies that the corridor model is using. Basically, this is the guts of the corridor. If we look at the Codes tab, however, the Codes tab actually tells you a what code set style this quarter model is using. In other words, how the point link and shape codes should display and if they should display. It also shows you all the codes being used within those subassemblies. Let's change our code set style to a visualization one because we're interested in getting ready to planimetric graphics. You can simply create a code set style that will turn off all the different components you don't want to display. If I click apply here, we'll go ahead and rebuild the corridor. You'll notice that in the plan view, the links and points and shapes are completely gone, and now all we have to do is figure out which feature lines we want to display within our corridor model. That's what the next tab is for. The Feature Lines tab is where you can control this. When Civil 3D creates the corridor, it uses the point codes to connect the dots, and it creates feature lines in the process. When you're ready to plot your plans, you can use this tab to turn on and off the display of the feature lines that you do and do not want to plot. Note that these columns are completely sortable. I'm going to sort them by the code. You can also select multiple feature lines, turning on and off multiple feature lines at once. I'll click the top one here and then holding the shift key down, click down to the bottom. I'll click in the quarter feature line style and I'll set my style to no display. This is a style that is created for you in the drawing. If you click OK, now, if you click Apply, you'll notice that every single feature line disappears. Now what you want to do is now you would turn on the feature lines that you want to and give them the style that would go on the correct layer so you could control them using standard AutoCAD layer functionality. So I want to toggle on the top back of curb and the back of curb. I'll select those two and those should have the same exact style. So we'll pick corridor curb line and click OK. I now want the sidewalks as well. So I'll select those two using the control key on the keyboard and pick the correct style there. Of course, we want the edge of travel way. So we'll, we'll click on that code and change it to the correct feature line style. And then we have the daylight. So for the two daylight and daylight fill, I want those two to have the same exact style. Note how you can have different styles for the different daylighting. So if you want to show some sort of custom line type for the cut line or the fill line, you can do so very easily. Now, if we click apply, you'll notice that these feature lines appear exactly as they should and on the correct layers being driven by the feature line style. That's really cool stuff. There are additional tabs in the corridor properties dialog box. We will discuss the surface and boundaries tab when we talk about corridor surfaces. The last tab, which is slope patterns, is a simple way for you to add a user defined pattern between sets of corridor feature lines. This is not widely used, 
but it is a nice way to display some sort of pattern to let you know how your corridor is modeling between two feature lines. In summary, we examined corridor properties. In the next section, we'll discuss corridor surfaces. Welcome to the fifth video of section six, discussing corridor surfaces. Upon completion of this video, you will have an understanding of how to create corridor surfaces. If you'd like to follow along with this video, please open the file 0605 CorridorSurfaces.dwg located in the training folder as discussed in the Working with Dataset for this course video. Let's take a look at how you create a surface from your corridor model. Remember how a corridor is structured. You have point, link, and shape codes as well as the feature lines now generated by the point codes. You can create a corridor surface from any of these object types as well as combining them. First, let's go ahead and select our corridor model. In the Modify Corridor panel, click on Corridor Surfaces. The first thing we'll do is we'll add a surface by simply clicking on Add Surface. You can click in here and give your surface a name. We'll call this one Road 1 and press Enter. You can also give it a style by clicking the Style drop down right there. Now if we look at the different data types to add, in the Add Data category, you will see here you have feature lines as well as the links. You always start out with the links as they should get you the correct type of surface. If you look at the specify code dropdown, these are all the link codes that are in our quarter model. So the one that we want to select is the top link code. So what Civil 3D will do is select any of the subassemblies where the link code has the top definition in them and apply it to our surface. Click on the plus sign, you now have that link code added to the quarter surface. Sometimes if your quarter model is not triangulating properly, you can toggle on add as break line and that will actually add the link codes as break lines and will help in triangulation. There's also a column called overhang correction. In this case, since this is all the top links, you want to make sure that Civil 3D selects all the top parts of the corridor model. So we'll click on top links. As mentioned before, sometimes when you generate the surface, it does not triangulate properly, especially around curves or intersections. So it is very helpful to add in the feature lines as well as they will tighten up the triangulation. You can also get erroneous triangulation if you add in the wrong feature line. So be careful with this. If you click on the feature lines drop down, these are all the feature lines that are in the corridor model. So we'll go ahead and add in back of curb and click the plus sign. Click the drop down again and maybe add in the top of curb to add better triangulation around the curb area. We'll also add in the flow line underscore gutter. Click add. Again, just helping to tighten up the triangulation as it goes around curves and in general. Before we click OK, you want to click the Boundaries tab. You want to add a boundary so you don't get any erroneous triangles around wide areas where the triangulation will automatically be connected. Right click on the corridor surface and let's simply choose corridor extent as outer boundary. Note there are some additional options to create a boundary interactively or automatically using the feature lines defined here. Click OK, rebuild the corridor, press Escape, and if we zoom in, you'll notice we're getting some contours already. We'll go ahead and select our surface take it into the object viewer to view the surface in 3D. Again, if you want to change this to shaded or wireframe or realistic, you can do so right there. And as you can see, we can zoom in and we can see our quarter model modeling very nicely through the curves and everything else. In summary, we examined how to create a quarter surface. In the next section, we'll discuss reviewing and editing quarter sections. Welcome to the sixth video of section six, discussing reviewing and editing corridor section. Upon completion of this video, you will have an understanding of how to review and edit a corridor model. If you'd like to follow along with this video, please open the file 0606 review and edit corridor sections.dwg located in the training folder as discussed in the working with the dataset for this course video. Civil 3D provides tools to review and edit your corridor model in section view. First, let's select our corridor model, and before we take it into the section editor, let's navigate to the Modified Quarter Sections panel, and let's first select the Edit Viewport Configuration. What Civil 3D will do is it'll provide a viewport layout where you can see your plan view in one viewport and your section view with a clipping plane in the other viewport. We'll change the viewport configuration to two horizontal, and we want plan and section. Click OK when you're done. Let's navigate to the Section Editor drop-down again and choose View Edit Options. These are all the properties that you can set as far as the display of the grid lines, the default scale, how you want it to re be rebuilt, and so on. Let's turn the horizontal and vertical grids off. This way it makes it a little bit easier to see the corridor model in section view. Scroll down to the bottom and change your code set style 
to view dash edit. This is a code set style that takes out the shape so we don't see the fill color and we can actually see a wireframe of our quarter model in a section view. Click OK. And now we're ready to go into the section editor. Simply click on section editor. And as you can see, Civil 3D provides a top view and a section view of the quarter model. So let's zoom into our plan view here. And notice that as we click through the stations here, there's a station tracker, which is really cool. It allows you to see what quarter section you're at. And then in the section view, you can see exactly what's going on in the section view. You can also click the drop down here and you can click on specific station views if you want to. Let's zoom into 108 plus a pair. So we'll scroll down to 108 plus a pair and click on it. Notice how it updates in our view automatically. There are some additional viewing operations. If you click on the zoom drop down here, you'll notice that you can set it to zoom to extents, zoom to an assembly, or zoom to an offset elevation. Let's zoom into a specific location of our quarter model and set the drop down to zoom to an offset and elevation. What this does is it allows you to simply peruse the stationing and see what's going on exactly in that offset and elevation. Pretty cool. Let's change it back to zoom extents and notice how it updates in the view automatically. What's great about the quarter section editor is that you can actually override the default modeling defined by the regions and parameters of the quarter properties. To do so, navigate to the Quarter Editing Tools panel and click on Parameter Editor. This opens up the Quarter Parameters palette, and what it allows you to do is it allows you to override any location and any subassembly as well as its parameters. So let's say at station 108 plus a pair, verify that you're at that station. On the right side, we would like to change the actual lane width to start at 108 plus a pair and widen at 15 feet and maintain that 15 feet for a specific station value range. So we'll expand the lane outside super right and we'll scroll down to the width parameter. In the plan view, let's go ahead and zoom in to that location. Remember, you have that planimetric line that allows you to see where you're at. Let's change this to 15 by clicking in here one more time. Let's change the width by clicking here and typing in 15 and pressing enter. Notice in the plan view, it automatically adjusts that. I mean, this is really cool. You actually can override and get your model to be exactly what you want and then your surface and volume calculations are a byproduct of that true design model. Now this is great and all, but what if we want to actually do this from, let's say, 108 plus a pair to 109 plus a pair, so 100 feet. If you had to do this manually for every station you model that, that would be a little bit of a tedious task. So there's a tool here called Apply to a Station Range. Let's go ahead and click on that, and we'll just simply type in 109 plus a pair and click OK, and you will notice how it automatically adjusts the links to show you that it's updating that value. Now it has not rebuilt the quarter, so simply click on Update Quarter Model, and as you can see, it automatically does that. I mean, this is just really, really amazing stuff. You're not limited to simply lane subassemblies. If let's say we wanted to change the actual slope here to let's say for this specific station range to be two to one, we'll go ahead and do so. Let's change our fill slope from four to one to two to one. We'll type in two and then press enter. You'll notice in here it updates automatically. Now, if I want to apply that to a station range, I'll click Apply to a Station Range, and we'll go ahead and type in 109.00 and click OK. And it'll automatically daylight once we update the corridor model. Really amazing stuff. Notice that in the parameters, there's an override column. So if you ever need to go back to the original way that the corridor was designed, you could simply toggle off these overrides and it would revert back to that model. Once you're done, to close the section editor, you can click on the close button here. And what Civil 3D does is it reverts back to the original viewport that you came from with the edits still in place. In summary, we examine how to review and edit corridor sections. In the next section, we will discuss an overview of intersections. Welcome to the seventh video of Section 6 discussing an overview of intersections. Upon completion of this video, you will have a basic understanding of intersections. If you'd like to follow along with this video, please open the file 0607 in Overview of Intersections.dwg located in the training folder as discussed in the Working with the Dataset for this course video. Civil 3D provides a very nice tool to help you create intersections. Intersections are the ability to combine centerline alignments profiles, offset alignments, and assemblies to create a single corridor model. The intersection can also be edited after the intersection is created. 
To create an intersection, navigate to the Create Design panel, Intersection drop-down, and you'll notice you have Standard Intersection, as well as many roundabout tools. Of course, what's great about the Intersection tool is that they provide dynamic modeling capabilities that will link all of the different aspects of the intersection for you. So for instance, if you were to change an offset alignment within the intersection, of course the corridor will update automatically. So where are all the components of the intersection stored? In the Prospector tab of the tool space, navigate to the Alignments category, and here you can see all the different types of alignments that exist here that were created from the Intersection Design tool. As you would expect, each of the different alignments also contains their own profiles, which are dynamic profiles linked to the other parts of the different resources being used in the intersection. There is also an intersection category. As you can see, all it does is list the resources that we just examined, and they are shortcuts to them. You can right-click on many of the different parts here, and you'll be able to edit a lot of the different parameters and properties from them. There is also an intersection object in Civil 3D. What's great about it is that if you select the intersection object, you'll notice in the ribbon you have many intersection type tools where you can edit the offsets, the curb returns, side row profiles, lane slopes, and so on. There's even an option to recreate the quarter regions if things get out of sync in some sort of way. So just to summarize, remember the Intersection Design Wizard is simply a tool that puts all of the different resources under one category, making it easier for you to make edits. In the end, you are still getting a single corridor object with regions and parameters. In summary, we examined an overview of intersections. In the next section, we will create an intersection. Welcome to the eighth video of Section 6 discussing how to create intersections. Upon completion of this video, you will have an understanding of how to create intersections. If you'd like to follow along with this video, please open the file 0608 creatingintersections.dwg located in the training folder as discussed in the Working with the Dataset for this course video. So let's take a look at how you create an intersection using the Intersection Design Wizard. Navigate to the Home tab, Create Design panel, Intersections drop down, and click on Create Intersection. Civil 3D is asking you for the intersecting point. When you hover over the intersection, it'll automatically know which alignments you are trying to create the intersection for. In the Create Intersection dialog box, let's set the name here to US-90 and SR-10. Notice the option to define the style. We'll leave it set to Intersection Marker. Notice the option for the label style as well. And notice the option for the intersection corridor type. So whichever type of intersection you would like to create, you can do so here. We'll make sure we set it to Primary Road Crown Maintain. Go ahead and click Next. You can set the priority here if you'd like to. And then you have the ability to define your offset and curb return parameters. We'll go ahead and click Offset Parameters. And in the Intersection Offset Parameters dialog box, when you click on the specific alignment, it'll actually highlight in the file. So here's where you can define the value that would match the lane width for each of the different roadways. We'll leave the defaults and click Cancel. Same thing with the curb return parameters. If you click Next here, you'll notice that Civil 3D highlights in the file as far as which quadrant you are editing. You can change the radius and so on. Click Cancel, we'll go with the defaults. And then of course you have the offset and curb return profiles. So what kind of grade do you want to apply to the main line and the secondary road and so on? We'll go with the defaults. Go ahead and click Next. You now have an option to either create a brand new corridor or add it to an existing one. Let's go ahead and toggle on Add an Existing Corridor and we'll go ahead and make sure it's set to US-90 and SR-10. Set your daylight surface for the sub-assemblies that will daylight to combine DG. Now what Civil 3D is doing right now is it's using something called an assembly set to define which assemblies to use in the different parts. Although the names will be the same, we want to define the ones that we have inside this drawing, so you have to click on the Browse button here to match the ones that are defined here. Notice that as you select them, it'll show you which section of the intersection it's going to apply these assemblies to. So we'll go ahead and pick the ones, just match them here. Make sure you pick the part section, daylight left, and the part section, daylight right. And then we'll do the secondary road, and this will be the left side, and this will be the right side. Click OK. Now let's say this set of assemblies could be applied to many other projects within your company. What you can do is you can save this as a set and what will actually happen is Civil 3D will not only store an XML file that points to the different assemblies, 
It'll actually save the assemblies as separate DWG files, making it much easier to reproduce this exact type of intersection. Let's click on Save as a Set. We'll navigate to our dataset folder, and we'll give this a name of Intersection Standard 1, and click Save. Now, if we ever need to load that back up, you would simply click Browse, and it'll load all the different assemblies used for this type of intersection. Let's click Create Intersection, and that simple, you now have your intersection completed. Normally, this is what should occur. However, sometimes you will see missing regions within the intersection, and it'll show blank areas. If you just simply do a Regen All, R-E-A, that should clean things up. But if it does not, simply select the intersection and navigate to Recreate Corridor Regions and Recreate Your Corridor Regions. Let's go ahead and view our intersection. Go ahead and select it. We'll go to the Object Viewer in the General Tools panel. As you can see, the intersection wizard has done exactly what we wanted to do, and the assemblies have been applied appropriately to each of the different regions along the intersection. Really cool stuff, and saving you a lot of time. In summary, we examined how to create intersections. In the next section, we will examine reviewing and editing an intersection. Welcome to the ninth video of Section 6, discussing how to review and edit intersections. Upon completion of this video, you will have an understanding of how to review and edit intersections. If you'd like to follow along with this video, please open the file 0609 Reviewing and Editing Intersections.dwg, located in the training folder, as discussed in the Working with the Dataset for this course video. Let's examine how you can review and edit your intersection. Remember, the intersection tools are simply ways for you to edit the different resources or components that are used to create the corridor model. Let's first look at the Tool Space Prospector tab and navigate to the Intersections category. If you expand the intersections and then expand the different subcomponents here, you'll notice that if you right-click on any one of these, you can edit the different parameters or settings related to the object that you are right-clicking on. That's one way to do it. Another way is to select your intersection object and navigate to the Modify panel and select the tool that you're interested in. Let's say we want to change the curb return for this side to 50 feet. We'll go ahead and click on Edit Curb Returns. And as you can see, when you click on Next or Previous here, it highlights in the file, notifying you which quadrant you're editing, which is really nice. We'll change this to 50 feet and press Enter. You'll notice that immediately it changes the radius and some of the lengths are kind of updating. But obviously, this is not completely updating the entire corridor model. We'll close the palette here, and we'll click on Recreate Corridor Regions. You'll notice another palette appears, allowing us to basically define any of the different settings that were used to create the regions in the first place. You can add to an existing. You can create a brand new one from here. We'll leave it with the existing corridor, and make sure we set this to Combined EG. Notice that you can change any of the assemblies that were used to create it in the first place as well as browse for a new assembly set. We'll go ahead and just simply click on Recreate because we're good with the assemblies used and automatically it is rebuilding the corridor model. Really cool. Now the next step that we want to do is we want to increase the frequency around these regions because it's not really tight enough to get proper triangulation and eventually a good corridor surface. The next thing we'll do after that is we want to tie in our other parts of the corridor model. So let's press Escape, go ahead and select your corridor model, and let's go ahead and click on Edit Frequency in the Modify Region panel. What's really cool about these tools is you can simply hover and it'll highlight the region you need to edit. We'll change the curve areas, because that's all we have here, to two feet in the profile and in the plan and click OK and immediately you notice it's updating. We'll click over here and change the tangent to two feet as well. Over here, change it to two feet. Two feet, click OK. And let's say we want to get the area over here really accurate as well. Click inside there and along tangents, profile curves, click OK. And lastly, we'll go ahead and pick in here and make sure we get the curves in there. Now that that's complete, press Escape once to end that tool. And now all we need to do is zoom in, make sure we pick the right grip, and then zoom back out here. And I can use snapping to simply snap to the station where this needs to tie into it you're actually manipulating the region's station-to-station -station values. We'll zoom in way close here and make sure we grab this grip there, zoom back out, and this will actually model the entire side road part. And it's dynamically daylighting as you would expect it to. And lastly, we'll go ahead and pick this grip here, zoom out, and make sure we snap to 
the end of the other region in the quarter model. And voila, it's all done. The only thing left to do is to show all the other regions. Remember, we have a quarter model that goes all the way to the beginning of our project. So how come they're not displaying? What was done for you previously was to simply hide the region. There's simply a toggle to toggle off the display of the different regions, making it a little bit easier to work in your intersection area. Let's go click the Modify Regions More Tool Options and click on Show All Regions. The corridor will rebuild itself. And here is our completed model. Really cool. One last note, you'll notice that there's an out-of-date icon with the intersection object. Do not right-click and rebuild or update the regions. If you do so, this will override any of the edits that we have done here with the frequencies as well as the edit to this curb return. In summary, we examined how to review and edit intersections. In the next section, we'll examine an overview of pipe networks. Welcome to the first video of Section 7, discussing an overview of pipe networks. Upon completion of this video, you will have an understanding of pipe networks and all their settings and styles and parameters. If you'd like to follow along with this video, please open the file 0701 pipe networks overview.dwg located in the training folder as discussed in the working with the dataset for this course video. A pipe network is a combination of pipes and structures that exist in a drawing. A pipe network can be displayed in any of the standard views, including plan, profile, or cross sections. Pipes and structures are defined in the part catalog provided by Civil3D. To narrow down the entire part catalog, you define something called a parts list so you do not have to work with every part that's in the catalog. Let's look in the drawing and notice that we have a few pipe networks already in our drawing. Notice that the pipe networks are displayed in plan view with labels and the profile view as well with labels. And any changes made to any of the views will update the pipe network automatically. The pipe networks live in the prospector tab in the pipe networks category and then if you expand networks, you'll see the pipe networks that you have in your drawing. There are many, many settings and styles you must define, or at least be aware of, in Civil 3D when it comes to pipe networks. If we navigate to the Settings tab and look at the different categories, we have Pipe Networks category, which is where your parts lists are defined, and you also have individual settings and styles for the pipes as well as the structures. The pipe and structure categories are used to control the different display options in each of the different views. Let's look at a parts list to kind of see how it all comes together. We'll double click Storm Sewer. This opens up the network part list dialog box. The part list will look at the Civil 3D catalog and pull out the different parts that you want to add to this specific type of parts list. The parts list also tells Civil 3D which styles to use for the different pipes and structures that you define in this parts list. So the pipes tab will contain the pipes that you would use for this type of parts list. As you can see here, we've got a concrete pipe and an HDPE pipe. You'll learn in a minute here that this is simply used for naming and labeling the pipes. There's no analysis going on based upon the type of pipe. You can also see how each of the different pipes is controlled by the style, material, pay item, as well as the rules. The same thing applies to the structures where you would add in the structures that should be in this parts list and the styles, rules, random material, and pay item for these specific structures in this parts list. You'll notice this column called the rules, which is available in the pipe and structure tabs. The pipe and structure rules control how pipes and structures are placed on the assigned surface. So as you place a pipe network across the surface, it will use these specific rules to define the elevations for the pipe and structures. Now, that said, you will most probably use Autodesk's Storm and Sanitary Analysis software for your real drainage design and then bring those files into Civil 3D. So honestly, when it comes down to it, the main functionality of pipe network objects within Civil 3D is strictly for plan, profile, and cross-section view automation. There is no analysis done within the drawing whatsoever. Finally, let's examine how you set the pipe network catalog for your session of AutoCAD. This is defined in the registry and will be defined across every drawing. To define the part catalog, navigate to the Home tab, Create Design Panel, and then select the More Tools options, and here's where you define the Pipe Network Catalog. As you can see, here's a catalog folder, and then within that folder, there are settings, files, and so on that allow you to navigate to the different pipe catalogs that will be available. 
By default, you have a US Imperial and Metric pipe catalog, as well as a US Imperial and Metric structure catalog. That said, it is possible that agencies you may work with may develop their own catalogs. You would simply click the Browse button right here to navigate to where their pipe catalog may exist. In summary, we examined an overview of pipe networks. In the next section, we'll configure pipe networks. Welcome to the second video of Section 7 discussing configuring pipe networks. Upon completion of this video, you will have an understanding of how to configure a pipe network. If you'd like to follow along with this video, please open the file 0702 configuring pipe networks.dwg located in the training folder as discussed in the Working with Dataset for this course video. Let's examine the settings and styles you should understand before configuring pipe networks. First, let's navigate to the Settings tab and then right click on the Pipe Network category and choose Edit Feature Settings. Just make a note that there are many, many settings that you define here that control many of the ways that you place pipes and structures within your drawing. Now let's navigate to the Pipe category. Notice how we have sections for pipe styles, pipe rules, any labels and tables you may create with your pipe objects. Let's look at a pipe style to see what's actually going on inside them. We'll go ahead and double click on Double Line Storm to go ahead and edit it. As you can see, the pipe style is segregated into different tabs that control how the pipe object that uses this style should display in the plan view, the profile view, and the section view. And of course, as with all styles, there's a display tab which tells Civil 3D which subcomponents to turn on and off inside each of the different views. Let's go ahead and collapse the pipe category and look at a structure style. Again, you have the structure styles, the rules, and any of the labeling or tables you want to create. We'll expand the structure styles and let's go ahead and look on a storm sewer manhole existing. Again, the style is segregated into each of the different views to view them. The only addition to the structure style is how you would like this to display in the model view. The model view is when you rotate the view, how do you want the actual structure to display? Typically, using the catalog defined 3D part is what you want it to be set to. That way, as you rotate the view around, it'll automatically show you the exact 3D model of the part. And then we have the plan view, which in this case would probably be a block, the profile, the section, and then of course, as is common with all, the display tab, which will tell Civil 3D how to display the structure object in the plan, model, profile, and section view, and which subcomponents should go on what layers, and so on. Now let's examine the rules. If we expand the pipe rule set, let's go ahead and edit the basic one to see what you have available to you. Again, rules are simply there to initially control how the pipes should get placed when you're laying them out in the drawing. You can, of course, change the invert elevations once the structure and pipes are placed in the drawing, but this just kind of gets it started. You'll notice there's a cover and slope and length check rule. To add a rule, simply click on the Add Rule button. You can't edit any of the values from the rule name here, but you can simply click OK, and then once you add it in here, you can then change the values of the different settings or parameters. If you look at the structure rules, click on Add Rule. Again, you have some rules to initially lay out the structure. Once you have it placed in here, you can then define the actual value for the rule that you add in. As a note, if any of the rules are broken by the placement of your pipe network, the pipe network will still be placed and you will receive a notification in the Prospector tab that tells you one of the rules defined by the pipe or structure is being broken. Now that you have an understanding of the different components that make up a pipe network, let's look at the parts list that brings these components together. Let's zoom to our pipe network category and expand parts lists. We'll go ahead and double click the storm sewer parts list to edit it. So the way that you interface with any part of the parts list is you right click on the different categories. So for instance, if you wanted to add a specific kind of pipe, you could right click on the actual part family name and click add part family. You'll notice here if you click on these, you get a nice little preview of what is actually going to be placed. Again, there's no analysis going on here. This is simply the structure of the actual pipe. If we expand the different pipes we have here so far, let's say we wanted to add a pipe size. We'll go ahead and right click on the concrete pipe and click add part size. And let's say we needed to add in a 36 inch pipe. So we'll click on 36. We'll click OK here. And now we have that pipe in here. So what we would then do is simply click on here and actually give it the name of the pipe. This will be used by the label. 
You then tell Civil 3D what style to use for that pipe, what rules to use for that pipe, and what render material to use for that pipe. So let's go ahead and pick on Concrete Cast in Place Flat Gray.1 and click OK. Again, it's that simple. The same thing applies to the structures. So if you wanted to add a structure, you would right click, add part family, and whichever structures are not already inside the parts list, you could simply add them in here. Same thing with the sizes. You would simply right click on there, click add part size, and add in the different sizes based upon the parametrics defined by that actual part. In summary, we examined how to configure pipe networks. In the next section, we will discuss laying out a pipe network. Welcome to the third video of Section 7, discussing laying out a pipe network. Upon completion of this video, you will have an understanding of how to lay out a pipe network. If you'd like to follow along with this video, please open the file 0703 laying out a pipe network.dwg located in the training folder as discussed in the working with the dataset for this course video. So before we lay out the pipe network, we must create it. Navigate to the Home tab, Create Design Panel, and then Pipe Network dropdown. Notice the options to create pipe networks. The one we're interested in is Pipe Network Creation Tools. In the Create Pipe Network dialog box, let's call this one P-SS. Let's verify that we picked the correct network part list. We'll pick Storm Sewer. And let's go ahead and click on the Layers button. This verifies that the pipes and structures will go on the correct layer in each of the different views. What we'll do here is simply click on this Layers button, and we'll add a modifier for a suffix called dash P. We'll click OK here. We'll do the same thing for the structures. This way, we have an easy way to freeze and thaw the pipes and structures in this network. Click OK. We'll use the FG surface. Just so you know, the FG surface is the finished grade surface. It's a combination of the existing ground and our roadway as well. That way, the pipes and structures will be placed relative to that combined surface. We'll pick the P-SR-10 alignment. This will be used by the labels to reference this alignment. For now, though, let's turn our labels set to none. This way, the pipe and structures will be laid out nicely without any congestion of the labels in the area. Click OK, and the network layout tools appear. Note that because of the parts list we selected, we will see those specific parts within our drop-down tier. Let's set our structure to a concentric cylinder structure, and we'll pick 6 foot DMH, and we'll set our pipe to 12 inch RCP. Make sure we have our slope set to down slope, as you can see here, but notice how you can toggle it either way. The tools available are pipes and structures, pipes only, or structures only. Let's go ahead and click on pipes and structures. We'll zoom into the end of our stationing because if we look at the profile, you'll see that the ground is sloping down that way. So we're going to start at the end and kind of move our way down stationing. We'll zoom in, and what we're going to use is the station offset transparent commands. I'll type in apostrophe SO and then press enter. Notice how Civil 3D prompts you to select the alignment. Let's go ahead and select the alignment, and notice how the jig comes up. The first station we're interested in is 14600, and press enter. The offset we want to do is 2.5, and press enter. Immediately, what Civil 3D is doing, if we zoom in at that station, is it places that structure at that elevation of the finished ground surface. The next station we want to apply is 14100, press enter. And for the offset, we want zero, and then press enter. Notice how the pipe and structure are placed, again, using the rules initially to place the structures and pipes based upon the FG surface. We'll press escape to end our transparent command. Let's change our structure to 54 by 12 by 83 winged head wall. And we'll go ahead and change our pipe to a 24 inch RCP. What we'll do right now is we'll simply snap the 5630 contour. The way that you can see which contour you're snapping to is to look at your coordinates right here. Notice that as I snap, you'll see it automatically shows you exactly that elevation that you're snapping to. Pretty cool. Let's go ahead and click right there, and there is our completed pipe network. Press escape to end the command. Now let's say we wanted to see all the pipes and structures parallel to our horizontal alignment in the profile view. Let's navigate to the Modify tab, and let's click on Pipe Network. And watch what this does. Notice how it updates the ribbon automatically with all the pipe modification type tools. Let's click on Draw Parts and Profile. If you look at the command line window, you have a few options. We want to click on Selected Parts Only. So we'll go ahead and click on that, and we'll pick on the manhole, we'll pick on the pipe, and we'll pick on the other manhole as well. And then we'll right click. 
Then it says select profile view. So we'll go ahead and click on the profile view. And as you can see, the pipe and structures are automatically placed in the profile view. Again, the really cool thing, if any changes are made to the pipe network object, whether it's in the plan or profile view, it'll update in both views. Now let's say we want to see an actual profile view of the entire network structure. We can do this very easily. While you still have the Pipe Networks Modify Contextual tab open, let's click on Alignment from Network in the Launchpad. The command line window says Select First Connected Network Part. So we'll go ahead and pick on this one here. And what you're doing is you're picking the last part that you want to plot within your profile view. So we'll go right down to the end, which is the wing wall. Right click and press Enter. Notice how it's going to create an alignment, because it has to. And it's going to be a miscellaneous type alignment, which is fine. Let's click on Basic for the Alignment Style. And for the labels, let's just pick on major and minor only. We really don't need them. It just helps us see the alignment. Make sure this is toggled on, create profile and profile view, and we'll click OK. In the create profile from surface dialog box, we want to actually add in the FG surface. Again, that's a combination of combined EG and the roadway. We'll click on add, and let's click on style, and let's set this to design profile and click OK. We'll click on the draw and profile view button. And in the Create Profile View dialog box, make sure this is set to No Grid. As we peruse the different options here, if you click on Pipe Pressure Networks, you'll notice it automatically is adding that pipe network in there, which is really great. Click on the Profile Display options to verify that your profile is not going to have any labels. Right now, it says Complete. So click on that, and we'll set this to No Labels, because we don't want to label the finished grade surface. We'll click Create Profile View, and let's go ahead and click it somewhere to the left of the pipe network. As you can see, it automatically shows you the pipe structures, including the finished grade surface, in a profile view. In summary, we examine how to lay out a pipe network and view it in the profile view. In the next section, we'll examine editing pipe networks. Welcome to the fourth video of Section 7, discussing how to edit a pipe network. Upon completion of this video, you will have an understanding of how to edit a pipe network. If you'd like to follow along with this video, please open the file 0704 editingpipenetworks.dwg located in the training folder as discussed in the Working with the Dataset for this course video. Let's take a look at some of the ways that you can edit pipes and structures in a pipe network. First thing we'll do is we'll zoom into our pipe network, and we'll go ahead and select a structure. When you select any pipe network object, you can navigate right to the actual properties itself of that object. So we'll click on Structure Properties. And within the Structure Properties dialog box, you can change the style being used. You can go to the Part Properties and change many of the different settings like the surface it's using, or the northing and easting here, the rim behavior, the sump behavior, and so on. If you look at the Connected Pipes tab, you can actually change the elevations of the actual pipe here. If you select it, you'll notice it actually becomes dashed in the drawing as well. You'll also notice that you can tell this object if you actually do want it to use rules from the rule set, or if you toggle them off, then it will no longer use those rules, and whatever elevations you have will be maintained. If we go ahead and select a pipe object, you'll get the same exact kind of functionality within the Pipe Properties dialog box. You can change the style. In the Part Properties, you can change the elevations, the slopes, as you can see here, and so on. And again, the Rules tab allows you to toggle on or off the rules or change it to a new one. You'll notice that this pipe is actually violating one of the rules. The maximum pipe length was violated. Civil 3D will still create the pipe, it just notifies you that the rule has been broken. Let's take a look at grip editing. You'll notice that in the plan view, if I go ahead and select the structure and go ahead and move it around the surface here, it'll automatically adjust the pipe object along with it. Now it is going to apply those rules as well, so any elevations you may have changed will be overridden right now. If we zoom to the profile view, you also get grips here as well. For instance, let's say because of the rules defined by this pipe, we have a minimum cover of some sort. This is why the structure got placed below here. We'll go ahead and select the pipe object, and with the grips here, we'll just kind of eyeball it. But of course, you could use the transparent commands to more accurately place your pipe objects and your infra elevations. Again, you could pick the different grips, and as you can see, it automatically adjusts everything for you. Again, really cool stuff. Let's press Escape to clear our selection set. Let's look at some of the additional modification tools. Let's zoom into our plan view. And for instance, let's say we actually place this structure with the wrong size. There's a swap part tool right here. And we want to change it to a 4 foot DMH. Click OK. That part is now changed and updated automatically. There are many other tools here. For instance, connect to part, disconnect, merge networks, split networks, and so on. 
Lastly, one of the really nice methods that's available for editing is actually your pipe network in a grid view. Let's go ahead and select our structure here, and let's go ahead and click on Edit Pipe Network. In the Network Layout Tools, you can click on the Pipe Network Vistas, and when you do so, the panorama window will appear, and you get two tabs here, one for the structures and one for the pipes. This is a nice global way to change things and see what's actually going on. Don't forget, if you want to change something globally, let's say, for instance, all three of these structures needed to use the same exact style. You could select all of them, and then don't forget, in the column header, you simply right-click and choose Edit, and that will change it for all of the objects. Note that some of the columns will be grayed out. They're simply there to display the properties of the object, and you just can't change them. In summary, we examine the different methods to editing a pipe network. In the next video, we'll discuss interference checking with pipes. Welcome to the fifth video of Section 7 discussing interference checking with pipe networks. Upon completion of this video, you will have an understanding of how to use interference checking to check for interferences between pipe networks. If you'd like to follow along with this video, please open the file 0705 interference checking with pipe networks.dwg located in the training folder as discussed in the Working with the Dataset for this course video. Civil3D provides a tool to check for interferences between pipe networks. There are a few settings and styles you would need to be aware of before starting the tool. Let's click on the Settings tab, navigate to the Pipe Network category, and expand it. In the Interference Styles, let's go ahead and double-click on the Basic Style. The style defines what kind of marker will be displayed, as well as how you want the interference volume to be displayed, if displayed at all. If you navigate to the View Options tab, let's set our solid options to Show a Sphere and Diameter by True Solid Extents. And again, the Display tab is simply what layer the components should go on and if they should display in the Plan, Model, and Section views. Click OK. Let's navigate to the Prospector tab, and let's expand Pipe Networks, and here is where the interference checks will live once they are created. Let's go ahead and create an interference check. Navigate to the Analyze tab, Design Panel, Interference Check you are prompted to select a part from the first network. Let's zoom in here, and we have a storm sewer network running this way and a sanitary sewer network running this way. It doesn't matter which ones you pick first or second. We'll just go ahead and pick that one first and this one next. What's great about this tool is that it actually allows you to define a 3D proximity check criteria. This is great if you need to check for clearances between pipe networks. We'll leave it toggled off and click Cancel. Go ahead and click OK. Civil 3D notifies us that we have one interference checking found. Go ahead and click OK again. If you expand the interference checking collection, you'll notice it lives right here. You can right-click on these and click on Zoom to. It'll put your view right into the location of the interference check. Let's go ahead and select the two pipes where we find the interference check as well as the symbol for the interference check. Navigate to the Object Viewer. And let's go ahead and zoom in. And let's change our visual style to realistic. Let's zoom in to our location, and you can see exactly where we're getting some sort of interference there. So what we want to do is we need to lower the sewer system. We'll go ahead and close the object viewer, press Escape to clear our selection set. So let's fix this by zooming out and going to the profile where this pipe network lives. Here's a little trick. Let's go ahead and select these two pipes and hold down the Shift key on the keyboard and pick the grips here. This is called Hot Grip Selection. And what it allows you to do is it allows you to stretch multiple objects at once based upon their grips. We'll simply grab this grip here. I have dynamic input turned on. And let's type in 50 to get it down to the elevation where we want to. That moves both. Press Escape. You'll notice how the interference check says it's out of date. So what we want to do now is simply rerun the interference check. Simply right-click on it and click on Rerun Interference Check. It reruns it based upon the criteria you defined. And as you can see, we have zero interferences found. Click OK, and that's how you do interference checking. Since this interference is no longer an interference, you can remove from the drawing by right-click on it and choose Delete. In summary, we examined what interference checking is and how you can use it to check interferences between pipe networks. In the next section, we'll summarize the course. Welcome to the last video of the course, summarizing what you have learned. If you'd like to follow along with this video, please open the file 0706 finaledwg located in the training folder as discussed in the Working with Dataset for this course video. Let's summarize what we have learned in this course. In this video courseware, we have taken a project from beginning to end. 
We discovered what Civil 3D is and how powerful a dynamic civil engineering model is and how it can maximize your productivity when designing a roadway project. We then examined the Civil 3D interface and the Civil 3D settings and style system and how it aids you in making it easy to find your data, uphold your CAD standards, and add design data to the drawings. We then discussed how to create surfaces from survey data as well as how you can edit them and how great a system it is that your CAD data is dynamically linked to the surface data. We then examined how to create and edit alignments and profiles and all the reporting capabilities necessary. We created assemblies and sub-assemblies, the building blocks for your corridor model. Then, you created a corridor model that was dynamically linked to all the previously created objects. We also examined how target mapping makes it very easy to add lanes and any other transitions necessary to accommodate your design. We then looked at how Civil 3D makes it easy to design intersections and making edits to them even easier. Lastly, we discussed the robust pipe network system that makes it easy for you to lay out your proposed pipe networks, edit them, and even check for interferences between multiple pipe networks. You know, let's look at another byproduct of having a true dynamic civil engineering model. As you can see, in the viewport on the right side here, we have true visualization going on. With very minor visualization experience needed, you can easily view and sell your design to project stakeholders as needed. The great thing, of course, about any of this visualization, any changes you make to any of your design data, updates the visualization automatically. Totally cool. On behalf of myself, Seth Cohen, and all at Pact Publishing, I would like to thank you for taking this video course and wish you all the best designing your projects using Civil 3D.